Yippee. It's a quick time, and this pen cast will probably not be a quick time. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Get it? Because it's always not quick. It's never unquick. It is a good time, though, isn't it? We can call it good, good time, good time, audio. I don't mm. know. I'm gonna go to bed now. <laughs> <sighs> Are you ready? <clears throat> I'm as ready as I'll ever be. More ready than I was before. Good. Same. Nice. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to episode number 40 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about fountain pen trendiness why nibs might be different even from the same manufacturers what's up with standard international long cartridges what one pen that we would keep if we had to narrow down our entire collection which i'm very excited about answering uh we're gonna be spotlighting the sailor pro gear mini and uh we got a tip of the week about ink cartridges so yeah well action-packed episode here I'm no. feeling it. I'm excited. Heck yeah. Can't wait to see what happens. I know. Now, full disclaimer here, our schedule's got a little weird, so we're actually shooting this on March 23rd, even though this is publishing on April 1st. So it's a little off. We had some schedule things. We shot some stuff in advance and then are kind of, you know, leapfrogging ourselves a little bit. So we're going to talk about what we've had going on, but it's not going to be like the super most current thing. But hey, that's okay. Uh, you know what we should do? What? Do you remember Do you remember on 30 Rock when they did that like disaster video where they recorded versions of like every possible disaster that could have happened, <laughs> like an alien invasion that's and right. stuff like that? We should do something like that, that we can just, if, some, if we, an alien invasion does occur, we're ready for it. And we can speak to that be like, hey, we know you came here to the pencast not to hear about the alien invasion. So we're just going to say, hey, our thoughts go out to all those abducted. But we're going right. to continue with Fountain Pen Talks. So we can just kind of flex something in, you know? Yes. I remember that. They had Robert De Niro as like the the guy saying saying all yeah, the, all the yeah. things. You're like, we're terribly sorry <laughs> for the families affected by the ape uprising. But um, We're sorry you know, for, the, for the hurricane that put out that devastating wildfire. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> Um, you know, not funny, funny. No, not it was, hurricanes. It was not real. So let's stick with anyway. apes in space, Brian. Don't go with real. All right, things. fair Come enough. On, I don't want to get too real with it. Gee, willikers. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, let's get right into it then with some feedback, shall we? All right. We're going to be merciful on the feedback this episode because last one yeah. we had a we whole were, heap and mess of feedback. So we're, we're going to keep it light. We're going to keep it light. I wanted to mention this comment um, from Kimberly. Kimberly says, "I would just like both Brian and Drew, that's us, to know." that this sole YouTube channel is helping me keep my sanity during my quarantine in Taiwan. Sad crying smiley face. Uh, I just let the videos autoplay throughout the day. Wow, like we're, we're, video we're like here for all you, Kimberly. day videos playing in the background? I, I guess so. I mean, when you're in quarantine, like it, this has got to be a couple weeks. So um, I mean, I understand. I've like found YouTube channels that I've enjoyed before or podcasts or whatever. I've just binged them as I've been doing some house project or whatever. So I get it. I get it. Well, I'm honored. Yeah, just, Thank you. Yeah, just take a break so that like you can listen to us after quarantine is over <laughs> and you don't just get tragic flashbacks. We don't want that either because... We're going to end Tell up like what. incepting your dreams and you, well, we're just yeah, going to well, like... <laughs> you can definitely have too much of a thing you think you like and then you end up hating it, like me and Honey Buns. Honey Buns, huh? You already oh, yeah. did it? No. Oh, when my mom discovered Sam's Club mm. and bought like a freaking crate of honey bun. She's like, hey, here we go, kids. <laughs> mm. Before school, you can have a honey bun. I'm like, yeah, honey mm. buns. Now, like, oh, and they were those, like, vending machine ones with, like, the white icing. Oh, you don't. Oh. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't, can't. I don't particularly I love those to begin with. I, I could see overdoing those easily. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I did. I did. I overdid the honey buns. I overdid Okay, it. I'm done. You know my story. <clears throat> I overdid it on apple cinnamon Cheerios when I was a kid. Uh, I do my, know that story. I guess I was kind of a literal kid sometimes, much like my son, Joseph. And uh, I just opened up a 
bag a bag because it was like one of those generic bags because that's mostly what my mom bought when i was a kid and uh yeah it was apple cinnamon cheerio knockoffs whatever it was uh call it, probably called like apple o's or something but uh <laughs> one of those like big 40 ounce bags mm-hmm. and uh my mom had bought honey nut cheerios and i was like oh honey that was like a special treat like the real brand name, name. brand honey nut cheerios yeah. and i was like "Ooh, i want to go to there and i was maybe nine or something i was very young and oh, uh, she was like, yeah, you can have some of that after you eat the apple cinnamon Cheerios. And in my childhood mind, I was like, oh, so I need to eat all of the apple cinnamon Cheerios. And then I will have some honey nut Cheerios. It, so I was I was prepared. I grabbed a giant mixing bowl. I poured like a oh. half gallon of milk into it. God. <laughs> and I proceeded to eat the entire bag of apple cinnamon Cheerios. And... Uh, I'll save you on the details, but let's just say... We can imagine what happened next. I didn't feel so great after that, and I had consequences. And uh, I now still have a taste aversion to apple cinnamon Cheerios. I could probably eat them. I haven't really, like, tried that much, but I never, like, look at them wantingly. So, um, but I still like Honey Nut Cheerios. Not my favorite. I, I, have, I, have, I have witnessed <laughs> Brian's dedication to food-related challenges. I'm, su- um, I'm surprisingly uh, competitive but not with anything that matters. I'll like challenge myself and everybody's like, no, Brian, seriously, you really don't, you, you shouldn't do that. And I'm like, no, I must do this now. Yeah. What, what was, <laughs> no how reason. many did we, how many tacos did we end up eating that one time where you, me and Sam tied, but you finished before us? I want to say it was like 11 or 12, something like that. Golly. Yeah, mm-hmm. you finished quick. I mean, I got them all down, but man, I, yeah. I, 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 was, I had to pace myself differently. My approach with the tacos, because Sam was trying to keep up with me. We are really on Tangentville here. Uh, Sam was trying to keep up with me, but my approach was to sprint out ahead quickly <laughs> and then just 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 demolish his morale. by Because yeah. uh, I, I, I knew I was going to like tap out at some point, but I just knew if I just aggressively ate a lot of them very quickly and seemed like I wasn't slowing down, then... <laughs> you were trying to attack our morale. Yeah. So I was talking a little smack. <laughs> But yeah, it worked. Oh, I like, ruthless. I ate like twice as many as anybody else. But anyway, oh, whatever. Okay. Not really. Sam did, pretty, um, Sam did pretty good, but he's... No, all three of us All three of us ate the same amount. You just finished before everybody else. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Yeah, I eventually got there. I was the third to finish. Okay. But we all okay. we all ate the same amount. 12 sounds like a lot. Maybe it wasn't that many. I don't I think 11 might have been the number. Be. I don't know. Anyway. None of this matters. It was, a, it was absurd. Anyway, I also <laughs> received from our friends in YouTube fountain pen world, Mm. uh, some tips on how to properly pronounce the V E R T in front of the few vert or bond colors, not vert. I have been avoiding saying it because I didn't want to say vert Vert. uh, because I knew that was wrong. (laughs) I just didn't know what was right. I never looked it up never or took the time to, I'm sure I could, but it was pointed out by a number of people that it is more or less pronounced ver. So ver olive would be vert olive. Not going to say that. So Vera leave. So I am now no longer afraid to say, well, what's the other one? Pray. It's not pray. See, there's another one. I don't want to Americanize it. Pray. Ver. Pray. Ver. Pray. Pray. Yeah. Ver. Pray. Oh, all right. There you go. Anyway, thank you for that. I always appreciate the insight that I lack. So thank you. There you go. See, I have, I have two years of, of high school French to fall back upon here. So, uh, yeah. Which is terrible because my last name is French. So people always ask me like, oh, do you speak French? And I'm like, no, I really don't. Uh, anyway, so uh, I got some feedback here from Ashlyn. It says, I have to say, I do not store my pens with water, but I do fill it up with water and let it sit for a day or two if Barney visited. Oh, you know who Barney is. Oh, the barnacle. Of course, the barnacle. Okay, okay. You got to watch out for Barney. If Barney shows up, you might need to soak your pen for a little bit. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, okay. That Barney I'm shows up when you least expect it. I'm with you. I mean, my Barneys, they pretty much get obliterated as soon as I get them wet. I've never really like had to soak soak Barney too yeah, much. Yeah, that's true. Barney doesn't like water. <laughs> um, yes, a couple, a couple of callbacks there. Uh, Mel said, hey, it's vastly reassuring to see that even Brian Goulet can have an ink disaster. It makes me feel better at my, about my inky misadventures. 
Well, Mel, that was like secretly my strategy all along was I just really wanted oh. to just like make it seem like, you know, I'm one of the people yeah. and like I can have mistakes too. I just want everybody to feel better. That's That was totally my approach the whole mm -hmm. time to getting ink mm -hmm. all over my hand. In the last episode, well, not the last episode, this would have been episode when... So we shot two of them last week, right, Drew? And it was the first one. Right. Well, you still technically had ink on your fingers last episode. 30, I did because we shot 39 right after 38. And I did wash my hands, but not very thoroughly. So you can definitely still see ink all over my hand. But anyway. Yeah, and you pointed it so, out too. Episode 38 or 39, you can see me with ink all over my hands. Uh, and then Andrea says, or Andrea, don't know. My sister's name is Andrea and she goes by Andrea, but I know other people are Andrea. So either way, sorry, I'm going to say Andrea because that's what I grew up with. Uh, Brian, I don't know why the kids don't turn on the fan in the bathroom. It's like they're allergic. Also, Brian, yeah, it makes such a horrible sound that we call it the demon fan. <laughs> we got Just two quote, quotable quotes here from Brian. We got, we got, well, well, she, she's pointing out the dichotomy there. It's like you said that you don't know why they never use it, but then you went on to also say it's absolutely terrifying and sounds like a demon. Yeah, but you know, the the demon fan thing that you have to actually turn the fan on in the bathroom to know that that's going to happen i think right but that, that that that's what they're saying we got two comments like this two people both pointing out how you were surprised they never used it but then also in that same sentence described it's the horrible terrifying sound it made yeah so it's like okay fair enough fair enough <laughs> This was actually, yeah, we had two comments almost exactly the same. I guess I didn't didn't quite see the connection, but it's not like the kids were like wanting to turn the fan on and then surprised by the sound. And they were like, dad, can you help me fix this sound? Because I really want the <laughs> fan Because I really on. want to use the fan. <laughs> no, it was that they never no. ever wanted to turn the fan on, period. But yeah, there could be a correlation there. I didn't quite make that connection. Yeah. All right, that seems very logical. Seems like kind of it was just kind of funny. Like I'm too close to it to actually make that connection, and then when other people point it out, I'm like, oh yeah, that's probably it. Anyway, apparently the uh, fans working well. Kids, nice. kids are less scared of it now. Not scared. They were never actually really scared. They joked that it was a demon fan, but whatever. <laughs> um, okay. And then I uh, got lots of positive comments about our small Banu update. So thank you everybody for just being kind hearted in the pen community. Um, we do have an update. Um, you know, they reached out to us and they um, also posted, uh, some, well, luxury brands, the, the US distributor posted uh, an update. So they basically, Banu has relocated to Armenia. They have moved out of Russia. There's no longer any manufacturing happening in Russia. And they've uprooted their entire life and they've made it safely there. They're working on getting reestablished there. So um, as it is right now, we're looking to keep the brand on the site. We've removed, you know, references to Russia there because they're no longer anything Russian affiliated other than they were born there. Um, but uh, yeah, they are now in Armenia. So, wow, just like when I sit and think about what it would take to do that, that was just, it's incredible. And they've really felt the love and the support from everybody in the pen community. It's been very disruptive, obviously, to their lives. And it's just crazy what's going on over there. Uh, but yeah, we're still in support of them and, you know, glad that they've made it there. Okay. So just a little update for anybody who's interested in what was going on with the folks at Banu. All right. Now we got some new stuff to talk about. So first thing that we got is a sailor. This is a North American exclusive called Soda Pop Blue. This is a transparent blue, maybe a turquoise. I don't know, Drew, would you call this turquoise? Uh, no, not. I don't think so. Is it more I think turquoise would need would need a little bit more green to it. <clears throat> See, I think. But then again, I it, don't know. It, turquoise is such a subjective color because the actual stone turquoise isn't even turquoise. Yeah, like, and a, then I, if you put green into it, I would consider that more teal and not turquoise. So I don't know. Either way, yeah. it's a nice, it's a translucent blue um, with some shimmer in it, which looks pretty cool. Um, and it's consistent throughout the whole pen. So Sailor lately has been doing a lot of, you know, like the excuse me, the cocktail series and all that. They've done, you know, somewhere it's like the barrel and the cap are one color and the finials are another and the grip is another. Um, but this is one's just consistent throughout, which is pretty cool. So this is gonna be in the Pro Gear Slim as well as the regular Pro Gear. Um, same pricing as their regular available ones. So 280 for the Slim, 392 for the, the regular Pro Gear. All standard of their seven nibs. So extra fine, 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 medium, medium, broad, zoom, and music and 
the nib looks really nice. This is their two-tone, what I believe is considered in the industry to be called gold out. So this is like, cause you can have two-tone where you have, you know, like the outside edge of the nib is gold and it's like silver in the middle or rhodium or whatever. Or you can have it be where it's rhodium on the edge and you have the gold that's more like the accent piece. This one is mostly gold and it has like the silver accent piece. Does that make any sense? I've heard this more with like Edison two-tone nibs back when they were doing that. They don't really have many more. This one's a little different, I guess, because it's got like kind of a strip. It's like, it's actually like three different colors. So, well, it's two different colors, but it's like a strip of rhodium kind of, I don't know. You'll see the picture. We'll post a picture of it. It'll make sense if you see it. But anyway, it's two-tone. It looks really, really cool. Matches the trim. Looks pretty tight. So that's pretty cool. You can check that out. Um, don't know how long it's going to be available. North American exclusives tend to be around. It's like a special edition sort of a thing. So um, don't know exactly how many they're making. It probably depends on, you know, how, how quickly they sell and which nib sizes are the most popular and that kind of thing. So you'll probably have, you know, a few months. Uh, now, imagine. last year they did a 1911 style correct they did yeah the pen of the year that was the uh ba -ba 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 -ba. i'm totally forgetting I think yeah i forgot it too the pen of the year. I, I have it was one. like a, mar was like a maroon color yeah i have one but i forgot what it was called um actually no it was just called the pen of the year it didn't have a color yeah i don't know that it had a color name it didn't it, they actually. just called it the pen of the year yeah i guess that could be confusing if it's called pen of the year and that's it every so year. So are they just, are they going to, do you think, I know that they, I think last year was the first year for North America. Do you yes. think they're going to do the 1911 Pro Gear, 1911 Pro Gear? Good question. You know, that's kind of thing. Like when they start doing something, when any brand starts doing something and you call it something like pen of the year, yeah. you start thinking like, does that mean we're going to have one every year? In and fact, like, last year, I don't think they did two sizes either, did they? I think they just had the one. I think you are probably right about that. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. Oh, they're so, just getting started. We'll see. Yeah. There's no standard yet. Until they do it yeah, for like, exactly. you know, three three to five years, there's probably no standard. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Like when Lamy does their special editions, I mean, they've they've now done them regularly enough where you can pretty much predict they're happening, but it was not always the case that they did a Safari and an All-Star every year. And the studio is like every couple of years. And, you know, sometimes the Safari has been like one or two or three or whatever, you know, they mix it up, so. They got, they, got, they got the ability to do that, keep things fresh. That's cool. Whatever. Either so, way, it's a beautiful, beautiful pen. I love the pens. Yeah, they look really cool. Um, and then we also got the Paniter Avatar UR Matte. This is a, uh, wait, there's a military, no, wait, military green. No, wait, I was looking at the matte black one, Drew. You were military green and lapis blue. I was looking up the black one. Yeah, we didn't, we're not carrying the black one. Yeah, we do. It's on the site. No, no, th that's not a new pen. The matte black. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, then I looked up the wrong color. Whoops. Okay, then I don't know what we're yeah, talking we are, about. Yeah, we already then. had that one. Okay. Well, let me look up what this one's a new. It's it's a new series of um, Avatar. You might see other colors at other retailers. We only chose the military green and the lapis blue. There you go. So um, if you do like them and want more colors, so, let us know. But we're starting with those. There you go. So the military green is like a dark, dark olive green. A um, little bit of yellow to it, but it's mostly just like dark green. Um, yeah, and then nice it's all olive drab. Yeah, and it's all matte blacked out trim, which looks really nice, actually. And then that uh, lapis blue, that falls into that like tealy kind of category where it's like a blue, but it's got some green to it. So I don't know what you'd call it, but it's a really nice yeah, blue color. terminology is weird. And when I said turquoise isn't turquoise, obviously that's not true. Turquoise absolutely is turquoise, but <laughs> you know, the actual <laughs> term and as it refers to color, it, it's kind of, it skirts a little bit more blue teal usually. So I don't even know what's reality anymore. We definitely don't know what's reality on this show. But anyway, you can get a steel nib, extra fine through medium on the avatar, $174. Uh, so check it out if you're interested in that. And Drew, you got some too. Yeah, we are picking up a few Midori paper products, which is a brand that we have had before. Um, prior to the Traveler's Notebook being called the Traveler's Notebook, it was originally referred to as the Midori Traveler's Notebook. Now it's just Traveler's. But we did at one point have Traveler's paper, uh, notebooks and pads. So they went away, but now they're back. We have had some demand to carry them. They're pretty versatile. And we're starting off with a few different things. You can check them out on our website. I'll leave some links below. They are pretty utilitarian and offer a bit of structure, not unlike some 
notebooks that are designed for bullet journaling, but not a lot of structure. They're more or less, they have features that would be conducive to someone who is going to be journaling or keeping uh, planners, you know, or um, any sort of daily record. So they are pretty much a blank slate, but then in a, uh, some weird ways, they're kind of also great for applying structure. So it's kind of hard to describe. You'll know it when you see it, and you'll definitely know it if you are one of those people who seeks out these sort of journaling opportunities. So check them out on our website. Very good paper and um, some fun products that we're excited to have up on our site now. Also from Tibaldi, we haven't seen anything new from Tibaldi in a while, but they did have a new Bononia release. So this is their um, more uh, pointed pen, not the one with the flat top. Same nib and feed as the rest of the Tibaldis. However, this one is going to be in a color called Celian Purple, which is a purple and orange. It's kind of half purple and half orange, not predominantly purple, but it's one of those materials that, depending on how you look at it, you could be seeing all purple on one side, but then you flip it over and it's all orange. It really just kind of depends mm -hmm. on how the stacked resin shows up on your particular pen. So every one of them is going to be unique, but it's a really cool color. The orange and the purple are pretty complementary, and it makes for a nice visual, uh, little visual thing happening there. Visual appearance sight. There you go. All those things. Nice. And then I wanted to mention that we did get a new-ish video out uh, that I wanted to mention. We had our team, including Brian and myself, discuss their ultimate fountain pen recommendations. And that was really fun to put together. We got um, Adrian, Brian K, and Jessica together from Customer Care. And we all gave our thoughts and opinions on what we thought our ultimate recommendations were not necessarily our personal favorites but what we end up recommending the most professionally having seen so many defects having to deal with if we give a bad recommendation it comes back as a return and then we have to deal with the return so like through that lens what do we find ourselves most often recommending and every person had a different pen and I will say, Brian, I uh, have been looking at the comments today, and there were a few people who had you and I uh, predicted accurately. So I'm sorry to say that uh, he and I might have appeared <laughs> predictable in that video, but uh, either way, I, I watch the video, find out if we said what you think we were going to say. Um, I mean, we weren't going and, for surprises here. We were no, no, we, were we certainly for, weren't. But you know, we have. We have a uh, continuity, you're right? Consistency. I guess so. Across, I guess our, so. across our videos, yeah. So either way, it was a really fun <laughs> video to produce. And if you uh, have missed any other members of the customer care team, now's your chance to say hi digitally. So there, there you go. go. There you go. Awesome. And thanks for putting that together, Drew. That was a little bit more to coordinate than our average video. So I'm really A little bit, but it was worth it. Yeah, definitely. All right. Now we got some questions. Let's move on to Q&A. All right, kicking things off is our old friend, mm. Brad the Bear, and he asks a very interesting question that I'm glad I'm not having to answer, but mm. Brian, how susceptible is the fountain pen world to trends compared to other industries like fashion? Ooh, trends, trends. Mm. I mean, I think, I think in any sort of industry, especially something that's you know, kind of hobby-based or interest-based, like what we have, there are absolutely going to be trends. Um, you know, think about like bullet journaling got really big or, you know, then you have shimmer inks that start to come out and they start Do to Do you remember the storm. wax seal boom? There was a lot of wax seal stuff happening when we, we first kind of started out. Um, I, see, I feel like that was kind of like 2013, 2014, right around there. There was something, it was a, yeah, there was like in the mid 2015, 16, something like that. Wax yeah. seals got really, really big and then it kind of popped. So and it just, it does. Yeah. Those ebb and flow. But I mean, so there's definitely trends that happen in the pen industry. It's not, maybe it's influenced by some larger, just kind of like fashion trends in general. I mean, there is a little bit of crossover that happens with some, you know, brands like Lamy pay a little more attention to some of like the fashion, you know, trends and colors and things like that. Um, you know, I think uh, probably most of the European brands might pay closer attention to that because they're in, I guess, a more fashionable kind of culture, uh, maybe than perhaps other parts of, I don't know, the where some other fan manufacturers might come from. I'm trying not to make it seem like that's a good or bad thing. I don't know, but whatever, there's like, Obviously, like I'm thinking of a company like Aurora, like they are located in northern Italy, like 
where fashion is like very, yes. very much in the culture of Milan and all that kind of stuff. So like it's all up there. Um, so certainly it's like more forward thinking with some brands. I mean, some brands like I'm thinking of Aurora again, because Drew, we went to tour the Aurora factory. They literally have done like pen collaborations with fashion brands. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Other ones, probably not as much. Um, I think fountain pens, because they've been around for such a long time and just the nature of pens, they're meant to last much longer than your typical article of clothing or whatever. Um, you know, and, and you're, you know, like you have to wear new clothes basically every day, not new, new, but you know, you're changing your clothes constantly, but you don't necessarily change your pens as often as your clothes, at least not most people. So I think there's like some trending nature to pens, but it's, much longer lens on things right not nearly as fast where fashion you'll yeah. have something different something different from season to season we might see trends every yeah. two to three years yeah maybe more like in terms of you see trends with cars right so like car trends you'll see things going like three to five years maybe 10 or 20 years that's a good yeah for like an enduring thing because there's a lot of you know the, the the lead time on designing and manufacturing you're doing a lot of different parts and stuff like that you can't just necessarily you know, like dye something a different color and then and crank it out. You know, clothing obviously is a little different, um, but uh, not to say that it's, you know, particularly easy necessarily, but that that whole industry is geared a little more towards, you know, trending and seasonality. Um, not as much seasonality when it comes to pens, not as much of the, um, you know, fashion uh, consciousness, I guess. Uh, I would say it's a little more, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know. T no, I was going to say like not tangential, but like parallel to some of it. Like it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Pens are not like, oh, they just released the uh, Pantone color of the year. And that's now you got half the pen yeah. companies coming out with some model of that. You know, you get a little, little bit of that. But I think, you know, it's sort of separate from most in generally speaking, most of the fashion that happens elsewhere. But there are absolutely trends that happen like you know, demonstrator pens, like Drew, since we've been in this business, you know, it, 10 years ago, you had some demonstrator pens, but it was not as like common. I mean, now almost every brand has some form of demonstrator pens. Yeah, I feel like when when, the, when you hired me, I think Pilot had the blue Custom 74 yeah. as a demonstrator. That I don't think- the, Yeah, and the clear, I I, the clear, the, the smoke maybe? There might've, no, I think smoke came after me. Really? I think that I think that Maybe the blue was like they the, might have had the blue, old... and blue and clear. I think they had a couple of colors, but yeah, they've expanded their tinted demonstrators. Yeah, but I think just demonstrators in general has been, you know, a trend. But again, it's not like it's gone away. I mean, it's something that's really endured for at least the last decade. So there are things like that: sheening inks, shimmering inks. You know, these kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, first it was shimmer, then it was sheen. Mm -hmm. Now I'm seeing a lot of the uh, this kind of um, shading. Uh, you know, dual tone. Uh, yeah, the multi-tonal um, kind of the chroma ink. shading inks. Yeah. Yeah. What's weird about that is like you'll often have with ink anyway. Maybe the ink is a little more prone to like some of the f fashion and kind of. Yeah. Well, like you like you said with the clothing, you can. It's more easily to you can. E yeah, more you're, you're changing use the same ingredients. Yeah, you're changing to, the ink out of your pens probably more often than you're changing. Well, I'm the talking. Pens I'm thinking themselves. about from a manufacturing standpoint. You don't need to create molds mm. or anything to make an ink. True. You just true. need to. You just need to mix it, just like cloth and yeah. fashion. You just need to sew it together in a different configuration. Yeah. Whereas yeah. cars and pens require actual molds and casting and things like that. Things yeah. that take much, much more time. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they 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 probably could be um, could be uh, viewed almost in different ways, like pens versus ink. Indeed. And then paper is kind of in its own little world over here. But, you know, yeah. It's more or less what you do with the paper that makes a paper trend. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, I really am not much into the fashion world in pretty much any way. Well, I definitely but, don't think that any of the like fashion forward brands like Aurora, you know, I love Aurora, but they're not driving the fountain pen industry trends for sure. Not, yeah, not globally at least. I mean, there's no. probably certain parts no, no of the one, world. No one's looking at Aurora and saying, I need to do that. Um, yeah, I don't know but, that anybody is really driving it. Like all the pen manufacturers kind of do their own thing. Yeah, they kind of do. No one is really setting the pace and then everybody kind of copies what they do. I mean, there's certainly, I mean, like Mont Blanc is the largest, you know, brand, I guess, 
um, in, at least in terms of their awareness and, and stuff like that, and maybe market share, I'm not sure. Um, but it's not like everybody's trying to copy what they're doing necessarily. Yeah, that's either. a good point. So it makes you it, makes you wonder like what will be the next big innovation that people will want to Yeah, I think it just kind of evolves, you know. It's that's part of what's interesting about the pen community is because you don't have you know, uh like trade organizations or you don't have, you know, industry driving like fashion events like i'm thinking again i keep going back to like clothing but you have like certain fashion shows and stuff that'll happen throughout the world and then there's a lot of things that get prepared for that and revealed and then people come out with designs inspired from what they see at these shows Mm -hmm. there's really not much like that in the pen world so everybody's kind of creating their own thing and they see what other people are making i guess but most of the manufacturers that we talk to anyway they're they're pretty much just doing their own thing and yeah. going off the feedback they're getting directly and you know their distributors and retailers and stuff that are giving feedback about their specific products so i think yes while there are trends it's it's quite grassroots like it's really driven by what people are buying and what people are asking for and that's really what drives kind of the industry as a whole so it kind of makes the whole pen the pen industry like fashion wise like more of an amorphous blob that kind of like generally works its way into certain directions you know but there's no one thing that's like really driving that so do you think do you could you be able to predict what the next fountain pen or ink trend is going to be not really i mean because it's such you know a, what I'm you know what I'm it's saying? such an amorphous blob. It's really hard to say because it's you know there's no well, one in, thing in, ter- in terms it. of ink. I think it's like you said. It's a little e- more easy to identify. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm seeing fewer heavily saturated inks these days. If mm. you look at a new company like Ferris Wheel Press, for example, you know we were recently talking about them on a couple episodes ago. Mm-hmm. Their entire line, for the most part, are pretty subdued colors. And they're very popular yeah. colors. And if you look at all of the colors that Sailor has recently come out with, you're talking mm-hmm. almost the entirety of their ink studio line, most of their Shikiori and Manyo inks, Manyo, and then yeah. some of these newer ones as well. Again, very subdued, cro- chromo shading, multi-tonal, mm. but the saturation just isn't there. And yet they're very, very popular. So um, that's one thing I've been noticing is hmm. just a decrease in the heavily, heavily saturated, very bright vibrant colors obviously there's plenty of companies that are always going to do that because you still right. want that in there you want that as an option hmm. but the new um you know more exciting releases have all been pretty uh, subdued in comparison to some of the ones i've seen in previous years yeah that's interesting that's that's probably like one of the more recent trends i guess you could say mm-hmm. that we've been seeing um but yeah it's it's hard to say it's hard to say uh so much of like covid life has really disrupted what manufacturers have honestly even been able to do. So coming out of some of that, and we're still kind of in it because the supply chain has been pretty heavily disrupted for the last couple of years. Um, So it's really more difficult now than ever to predict what might happen in the future. But, you know, there's definitely stuff that's going to happen because I think there's a lot of people that have been like, had pent up ideas and things they've wanted to do. There's definitely stuff that's going to happen. Yeah, so we're going to start to see a lot of that. I agree. So it'll be interesting. But yeah, good question, Brad. Stuff stuff will happen. Yeah. All right, next question we got. This is for you, Drew. Uh, this is from Mary Ann's Book Life. Many pen companies use the same nib, like Yovo or Schmidt or Bach or whatever. Why do the pens write so differently? The feed, what's going on here, Drew? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the feed for sure. Um, now, one thing I'll say to kick things off is that yes, while we might hear, and even us as retailers, will hear that one company makes this brand's nibs and that brand's nibs, it's not something that everybody is super 100% transparent and forthcoming about. There are some pens that might have initially been made by this company and then started doing their own thing and just didn't say anything to anybody that has happened well, they, some pen yeah. some brands um use a little bit from column a a little bit from column b and don't really say anything about it but yet all that gets out there is that they're using something from column a so it really all depends we're, we're at the mercy of what information the manufacturers go out of their way to share mm-hmm. and you know we've got you the consumer us the retailer the distributor and then the manufacturer 
and they're kind of so far removed from the end user that the information going from you know point a to point z like Good luck, right? I mean, we do our best to make sure that everything on our product page has all the information that we have, but it's not going to be everything. And in terms of, you know, which company is using which nib, it's not going to be perfect always mm. as well. Um, other times, you can have a nib like um, Yovo, for example, um, that uh, makes a nib for a company, or at least, you know, was at one point. But just because they're producing a nib for a manufacturer um, or a pen brand doesn't mean that that pen brand is using their stock option. So you could get not stock option like financial, but their their kind of generic version of their nib. You know, so like we sell Yovo's generic nib, the one with the GP on it that we sell on our site, our Goulet nib. That's just a plain old Yovo nib, nothing special done to it at all. And you could see a nib very similar to that with another company's logo on there, but there's really no telling what they've done. Maybe they tune them a little bit. Maybe they do something to them. It might actually look like the same nib, but you never know what companies do after the fact. Sometimes they're very transparent about that. Sometimes they're not. So that's definitely something that can happen. Mm -hmm. And Yovo might actually be making a nib for a company, but making their own version. That's not at all their stock shape or um, under the stock specifications. They're made to the specifications of that one company. So that could cause it. You know, just because it's Yovo doesn't mean it's the same Yovo. There are a bunch of different Yovos, a bunch of different Schmitz, a bunch of different uh, box. And then, um, yeah, like I said, the brands themselves might actually do um, some after work to them. And, you know, I would love to give examples of all these things I've said, like which company is using which. But, oh, my God, we, we don't even know. It's changed so much throughout the years. If I say something now, it's not going to be true you know, a couple months from now, maybe not even next week. It's something that is constantly in motion, especially now um, <laughs> with the supply chain issues, as yeah. we mentioned. We do, like, Yovo nibs are getting harder to come by. People are having to pivot, and I, I'm just glad we're not in the pen manufacturing business, Brian, because it is not easy out there. It's pretty it is not easy. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, what I like to equate it to is sort of like, you know, if you're going with, say, like, a pair of jeans, like, think of, like, Levi's as a jeans maker, you know, it's sort of like asking the question, like, why don't all Levi's jeans fit me the same way? It's like, well, there's different cuts of jeans and they they make different jeans for different price points and all these types of things. Like there's a certain base level of maybe quality and supply and QC and stuff like that that you might get. But, you know, if you were to, maybe the jeans analogy is a bad one, but I'm thinking like most pen makers, they might even tune the nibs after they get them from the main, you know, the actual nib, just kind of raw manufacturer. You know, they might be using their own feeds that's different from the ones that they could get from them as a supply. So there's like tweaking and stuff that could happen down the line. So I think saying something is Yovo made or Bach made or whatever, it's good for a certain just base level of trust and understanding that like, yes, there's a certain level of consistency, a certain level of something that we can rely upon here. You know, that it's not just some randomly outsourced thing, um, you know, generally speaking, you know, what, what Drew said is true that there is sometimes stock issues and things like that. And then when it comes down to like, if they don't have the nibs, they can't sell any pens. And sometimes it's better to source from multiple places than be out of pens altogether. You know, so there are hedging, some hedging like, your bets. Yeah. And there are some that, and, and it, it kind of swings too. like for a few years, like Bach was the one that was making it for everybody. And then it kind of swung back the other way. And then Yovo was making it. And now it's probably somewhere in between just because everybody's having supply issues and stuff. So, um, you know, oftentimes it's like, they'll, you know, they'll have supply of, of one particular type or size of nib that they'll use, you know, a pen manufacturer will use if they have, you know, smaller, smaller pens that use smaller nibs, they might use Bach for those, but then use Yovo for the larger ones or whoever, you know, or some might make in-house and they might outsource some other ones just because of their own, you know, supply, uh, you know, concern, constraints and stuff like that. So generally speaking, we try to advertise it when we know it and when, you know, it's it's just you know something that we can find out and and uh, is helpful to to share. But you know in general, what we're really trying to do is to convey a certain level of of quality, a certain level of accountability um, for the manufacturing of these. But that doesn't mean that just because it's made by that manufacturer that it's going to be an entirely consistent experience across every pen that uses that manufacturer. Of, yeah. of nib there's a lot of and we'll we'll get into that a little bit later as mm -hmm. far as you know how manufacturers you know uh uh 
what well, consistency goes but even the best nib manufacturers in the world like you, the tipping mm. can play a massive role in the line that it's yeah. getting put down and you're talking you know a very small margin that you're having to work with in order to get consistent line widths on every single nib All that tall that small little tiny ball of iridium alloy or whatever super hard metal is on these nibs that needs to be it's, it's so tiny have you seen these especially with like extra fines there's not a lot there and that needs to be perfectly welded on the top of these steel or gold nibs every single time they're not all going to be the same you're talking you know microns there and if and even if the shape is a little bit wonky then that's going to produce a different line as well yeah. and like brian said and what uh, the question originally said about the feeds yes absolutely the feed matters it matters massively probably mm -hmm. more than any of us ever give you know remember to give credit for it frequently yeah so the ink channel is a huge difference you know one might be using the more standard yovo feed one might be a yovo nib on you know another random feed and the ink channel on these feeds are going to play a massive, massive role. So those were going to provide you with two completely different writing experiences. In fact, yeah. if you take, and if you took those same Yovo nibs, let's, for sake of this hypothetical, they're the exact same Yovo nib on two different feeds, two different housings, and you swap them, you could have another variable experience because one nib might be fitted to that feed, to that um, housing, and the other one, the opposite so switching those you're taking the same nib but the curvature of that feed into that housing could put pressure at a different point on the nib that could cause the tines to open up just a hair or tighten just a hair or mm -hmm. even cause you know if pressure is being put more on the back of the feed nib it could cause the nib to actually raise up a little higher above the feed again affecting flow so it you have a host of variables a massive host of variables when it comes to different nibs going into different feeds and then different nibs coming from the same manufacturer sometimes so yeah. um there's not one answer for sure but all of the things we mentioned are absolutely variables at play feeds probably being chief among them um but manufacturing consistency is a huge one mm -hmm. and then the indeterminate amount of you know, um, manufacturer fine tuning and tweaking that could occur between the nib manufacturer and the retailer as well. Yeah, there you go. Simple answer. I wish it was easier to communicate all this stuff, but it's kind of just kind of hard to be quite honest. Yeah. With you. All right, Drew, you got okay. the next one here. I do, I do, and this comes yeah. from Ambrogio. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Ambrogio de Milano, and Ambrogio asks, "Why are Lamy steel nibs so inconsistent?" I've seen extra fines that write differently, and my fine is like a medium. Brian, what's up with that? Yeah. Good segue from the previous question, right? Indeed. Um, yeah, I do hear this from time to time, specifically about Lamy, more so on the extra fine nibs than anything else. Um, but the thing is, like, I've personally observed some differences, but not anything that's that much more dramatic than maybe what we've seen from other brands. I think there might be a little bit of a case of, you know, Lamy's just a brand that's more recognizable. You know, they have a lot of pens that are in the more affordable range that a lot of people start out with things like Safaris and All-Stars. Um, so I think that there's maybe just some recognition around that. And then you get like the negativity bias a little bit that if somebody's posting about, oh, this is, this pen's not writing like I expected or whatever, you know, there's, you're more likely to see and remember and comment and pay attention to the things that, you know, seem like problems or are inconsistent. You know, certain brands like Lamy and Visconti and others have often get talked about more and i think with lamy's case part of that is because they just have a lot of pens out there uh, and so a lot of people have recognition of the brand so when the topic comes up online they pay attention to it and so it sticks in their brain more or maybe they have some experience that they want to share you know that may be consistent or inconsistent with what's being talked about so i think there's maybe just a little bit of that um the thing is i did i i've talked to lamy before about the extra fine nibs specifically because that's most of what i've heard in the past and they said that some of the inconsistency that happened specifically with the extra fines is because the machines that they have to actually grind those nibs and smooth them and stuff like that you know these are these are relatively affordable high quality steel nibs so there's only so much kind of like 
personal attention and handwork and stuff like that that can go into them. So most of it's you know mechanized um, when they do, it. and they've got some pretty cool machinery. If you watch the Lamy's How It's Made video when I toured back several years ago, you can see some of how those machines work to like cut these nibs and weld the tipping on and all that kind of stuff. So it's 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 mostly fully automated. And they have machines that check the tolerances and everything. It's it's pretty intense. Like they have some of the highest mechanized QC of any brand that I've seen. Not to say others don't have it, but that's the most advanced that I've seen, especially they doing something like 10 million steel pens or something a year. It's, it's a lot of pens mm -hmm. that they're cranking out thousands and thousands of nids a day. And they build um, all these machines too, right? Yeah, they, they have to custom Crazy. make them or they adapt Crazy. them from other industries because I mean, who's making, you know, five ton, you know, nib making presses and stuff like that for this one part. They have like basically an entire room that's like the size of our warehouse that's filled with nib making, you know, equipment. It's it's incredible. But, you know, you, you figure like they're making them at a certain price at a certain scale. So it has to be mechanized. So they're relatively consistent with the fines and broads and stuff like that. The extra fine though, uh, from what they've told me, at least this was several years ago, is that because it's ground so fine, they, they can't automate it as much as they can with the other nib sizes. So there's more handwork involved in you actually grinding those and stuff like that. So uh. of, of course you're gonna have more variability when you have handwork that's involved there. And you know, if you have a gold nib, okay, you maybe have a little bit more time to work on consistency and stuff like that. But think about it, these are steel nibs. They don't charge any extra for an extra fine nib as they do for any other nib size. So, you know, they've, they've, they can spend only so much time and they can only QC within probably a certain tolerance, um, you know, for these extra fine nibs. So I think some variability is, is going to just have to be ex accepted. I think that's fine. I mean, I don't know for a fact that they have like more variability on that than they do in any other nib size, but I would imagine that they have to run the numbers and just say that, that you know, they can't scrap half the nibs if it, you know, is not within a certain tolerance. So I think that's maybe part of it. And then also, I think what Drew mentioned a minute ago, when you have an extra fine nib, you naturally just have a smaller tip size to begin with. So any variability that you have is going to show up more proportionally than it would on say a medium or a broad or a stub nib, right? So just looking at some of the math, right? So an extra fine nib, say just for the sake of numbers, that it's like 0.3 millimeters in width, right? So if you have like a 0 0.05 millimeter tolerance, that's like a 17% variance. Whereas on a broad nib that might be 0.8 millimeters, that's only gonna be a 6% variance. So the exact same actual width difference in variance, which is what it's gonna be if you're, you know, smoothing a certain amount or using a machine to do that, whatever, but the proportion of how much drastically different it'll seem is going to be much greater, uh, at least in terms of line width on an extra fine than it would, you know, in proportionally every other uh, nib size that would happen. Now, in terms of like nib scratchiness and all that kind of stuff, I think inherently you're gonna have more variation there with things like an extra fine as well, because you just don't have as much surface area on the tipping of the nib. So it's gonna be more difficult to tune that to be very consistent, especially on a more economy priced nib. Um, so that's why you'll see some of that. And then again, just the volume of nibs that they're selling, you're gonna naturally have more people that are talking about it, reading about it, noticing it, that kind of thing. Um, so that's part of it. And then I think when you have other factors like paper, ink, writing angle, writing pressure, all that kind of stuff, that all comes into play as well. Not to say, like if you have your own stuff and you know you're more consistent with that, that's one thing. But then when you read online and you're comparing you know, stuff that different people, different experiences, there's so many factors that can come into play that it makes it difficult to compare. So. I do hear some and probably very legitimate experiences that some people are having when they're like, I have three extra fine nibs and they're a very different experience, or I have a fine that writes more like a medium. Undoubtedly, that's going to happen from time to time. And there's gonna be some of that, there's gonna be tolerances within their QC. You know, some of that is like, that's, that's kind of how nibs are. They're not, I mean, they make them to within, you know, a certain target, a certain specification, but you know, there's a lot that can happen uh, down the road and you're working with some some rather fine tolerances at these nib sizes. Do you think that the steel Lamy nib is the most, like if you could look at extra fine through broad, the, the, mm. the, the gamut of the steel Lamy nib, would you s wager that that's the most produced fountain nib in the world by volume? <sighs> Boy, that's really hard to say. 
I think it might be, right? I mean, imagine, like, there, the amount that these Lamy nibs are shipped all over Europe is crazy. Like, of a single type of nib? A but single type of nib, yeah. Potentially. It has, to, it has to be the Lamy steel nib, right? What what else would come close? I don't know. It's like, it's like tough, pi- Pilot, then, Pilot's MR nib might be, you know, yeah, up Pilot, there. But, I, but the, yeah, but, Pilot's got but some. But then you think about how many sizes of those do they have. They don't have the amount of size. So I don't think, I can't imagine that by I don't volume. Know. Pilot, Pilot might give them a run for their money because they're pretty yeah. big. I just, I don't have any insight into how many, like how much Pilot sells in like Europe and Asia compared to the U.S., yeah, you know, that's all, a tough one. All we really know is how much is sold in the U.S. Um, and pilot, we do know that we do know that Lamy is way more uh, popular in European countries than it is in the U.S. True, like, true. Th- that that that's like a, that's like a school pen. Like yeah, students yeah, get those. It's, a, it's 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 let's put it this way: it's up there. If it's not number mm-hmm. one, it's, it's definitely up there. Top three, probably. Yeah. So yeah, I would I would say that's got to be a contributing factor. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, and then you get into you, you, other brands like Platinum and stuff like that. Like they have different steel nibs that they put on like a Preppy Plaisir kind of thing than they do on say the uh, Curidas or the um, Procyon or something like that. So like even mm-hmm. those, it's not like Lamy in that same price range would have all the same steel nib, right? So, you know, you're getting a consistency of um, nib usage across all those different models of Lamy pen. Uh, Pilot, you get some of that too with the steel nibs other than the Varsity. You pretty much have the same pilot steel nib on everything. The Kakuno, the Explorer, the MR, the Metro. Yeah, you know, so the, if you the, add with all the... those up, it's tough to say. I don't know. Yeah, Probably... it might be it might be pilot, but I think that yeah. worldwide Lamy just is everywhere. Well, and Lamy sells their nibs separately too, so we sell Lamy right. like spare Lamy nibs. So there's more of mm-hmm. those too. So it's really tough to say. But then... yeah, and they market <laughs> them as being very swappable too. Yeah. So pe- people are swapping more Lamy nibs than they are pilot nibs for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's it's really hard to say. I would say, mm. you know, if if you're not having the experience that you want to be having, reach out to the retailer that you bought it from, and they'll take care of you one on one. You know, I, I know that there's an, an unbelievable amount of QC and stuff like that that goes into making these nibs. It's honestly just just really really hard to do. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to bust on anybody because honestly, I think if it's, if a company like Lamy with as many resources and as much attention that I know that they have done to make these things consistent, if they still have trouble doing it sometimes, it's, it's because it's that hard to do. So I don't want to bust on them, but you know, I know they're doing a lot to try to, to try to combat that. And, you know, uh, I would, I would do it worse. There's no question. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had conversations with a lot of manufacturers over the years about nib QC because it is hard to get perfect. And it's we've tough. talked about we've probably talked about every single manufacturer on our website at some point about quality, you know, yeah. be it a little thing or a big thing. We've all, we've had these conversations. So, and not one of them is not interested in being better. That's for sure. Yeah. They're all trying. They're all trying to be better always. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Next question I got this is from Torpedo Monkey. Uh, so Drew, why are so few manufacturers making long international ink cartridges? Well, Mm. for those of you who don't know, the standard international cartridge small is very, very common. You see that on so many, so many pens. And then there was also a standard international long. Those really right now, we only sell them as the Pelican Edelstein line. Yeah. So they're much, much less common. But one could argue, why not the bigger cartridge? You get more ink, right? Well, Mr. Monkey of the Torpedo variety, if I were an ink manufacturer, I would not make a standard international <gasps> long. <laughs> For a lot of reasons. <laughs> For a lot of reasons. Uh, a, the ch- chief among them being, they don't fit as many pens. If you're going to make a mm. cartridge you're going to want to make it to fit the most pens because that means you're going to sell more, right? And they're not Mm. going to sell as many if it doesn't fit as many pens. With the standard international short, you're going to fit all your pocket pens. You're going to fit everything else that can fit a standard international converter. So basically, you know, the, the mouth of these things are the same, the standard international converter, the long and the short cartridge. So you can, because the standard international short cartridge is shorter than the converter, anything that can fit the converter is going to fit the small cartridge so that's a surefire thing if you want to make cartridges that's your best bet because 
the compatibility is just not an issue. It's that's that's the thing that is the it's more compatible than card converters are. So that is the the, the optimal compatibility option if you're going to make some ink stuff. The long cartridges, those are just weird. I, I tell you, um, <laughs> the there are pens <laughs> just this week. Um, Brian, just, I don't know if you saw they're this. Just weird. They are, man. <laughs> did you did you see us talking uh, here at the office this week about the Edison issue? No. Okay, so we just found out uh, Brian K was no, maybe it was Ethan. I don't know. Somebody was talking about how a customer just let us know that the standard international long doesn't fit in any Edison except for the Collier. What? Yes, and we tested it. Huh. Or someone in customer care tested it anyway. Interesting. I know. So we're st- we're still looking into that. Obviously, we will change our site if that's you know, true. You know what? But it, well, you know what it is. So, yeah, it's the taper. It's the it's the yeah. the um it's, it's it's the way these pens are um made to fit the converter and the converter you know tapers in a way that the standard international yeah, cartridge like you doesn't. Got the, you got the you know uh, on pretty well on pretty much all of them, not exclusively every pen because there are some you know like I think Visconti's maybe done some or. I remember Delta used to have something that have like the metal shroud over it. They're like more of like a premium yeah. converter and, the, and yeah, those are yeah. thicker and stuff like that. But your your typical standard international converter is going to have like that tapered end to it, you know, sort mm-hmm. of like the the uh, end of a like the, the, the working end of a short cartridge is tapered kind of like that, too. Mm-hmm. But the the long cartridge is fat, you know, it's just a blunt cut off end. So it's like the thickness of the actual middle of the converter here. So on particular pens, there might be enough length on there, but if there's not enough length, that's the full thickness of the end of that long cartridge, then it's not gonna fit. Even though it Mm -hmm. could or should, it might might not fit. So we would love to say that every (sighs) pen that can fit a converter could fit a long cartridge, but we just can't because that's not true. Yeah. So because we can't do that, that means that you need to like the compatibility thing. That there's the issue. Well, so, so yeah, you get more ink. All right, Drew. But is, is this like a chicken and the egg kind of thing? Is it that they're not that popular because manufacturers aren't like adopting that and making that more of a part of it? So ink makers aren't making them because they don't fit as many pens, or is it more that? manufacturers aren't making it because people aren't really buying them anyway so ink makers aren't going to make them so why design the pens to fit them you know what i mean yeah I, I, like which, I would, which is the cause here I, I pocket pens are nothing new people have been making you know uh lanyard necklace pens and pocket pens since fountain pens were a thing so Mm -hmm. the the length of a standard international long cartridge wouldn't have fit then either even though their cartridge filling pens weren't a thing when fountain pens first were a thing but even then like i it would not have been universal and it never would have been predominantly the choice over a short cartridge just because of the compatibility question um so I mean, and honestly, there are there are some you know. Furthermore, with the whole compatibility conundrum, there are some pens out there that can take one standard international converter, but not another standard international converter, and those sometimes have to do with the actual length. There have been some pens that, even with their own brands converters, where you'll put the barrel on, and the barrel will just slightly twist the actual knob of the converter and could potentially lead to ejecting ink out and then we have to reach back out to them and it's a whole thing. So a lot of these pens are made to fit the converter to just the tiniest, tiniest little degree of space between the inner walls of the barrel and the converter or cartridge itself. Like they don't leave a lot of room in there because they manufacture these to be used with one thing, whether it's the standard international short cartridge or the converter that these things were originally manufactured for, they're just not thinking about well, like, well, let's make it this way so that if someone wants to do this, they can do that. Like now, they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about that one thing and that one thing only. So the safe bet is standard international short. And that's why they're as popular as they are, because it's an unnecessary gamble to go with the long ones. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And what's interesting yeah. is like it's it's a little confusing because they're called standard international but actually if you go yeah. if you go to uh iso.org which is the international organization for standardization which is weird because it's called iso but it's actually ios is the acronym 
which okay. I, so immediately when I went to the site, I was like, why is it ISO? Why is it not iOS? That's really confusing. But they actually explain it on their site. It's because it's international. And depending on which language that you're actually reading the words, the acronym is different. So they standardized it no matter which language it is to be ISO, which is, this is a deep dive here on the ISO organization, but um, so they decided to do that because it's derived from the Greek word isos meaning equal. So they went with ISO. So anyway, but you've heard like ISO 9001 or whatever the heck, like, so it's like there's standardization in the manufacturing world internationally for this kind of stuff, but there's nothing registered here about cartridges. So it's a lingo that's been adopted for just marketing sake or the ease of just talking about it, but it's not actually a super defined registered international standard. So even, and we've seen this with converters, Drew, oh my goodness, you get standard international converters, but some of them don't quite fit all the way on or the length is slightly different or da 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 da. And it yeah. gets kind of confusing. It's because of just the evolution of international, of, of really just all ink cartridges and, and converters, because you know in the earliest days, every brand came up with their own proprietary design. And just over time, certain ones have adopted more consistent kind of standard ones. I don't know exactly who it was that came up with the standard the currently adopted standard international version. It's been like, some people say it was Cross. Some people say it was like Mont Blanc had a heavy hand Pelican. So there were like certain larger brands that sort of adopted this standard international. But again, because it's not anything that is truly standard, you get this kind of like amorphized, you know, uh, adoption. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but yeah, no, that makes sense. You, you, and you get this this thing. It's more like something that's happened over time, not something that one one clear like initiative was done to make this standard across. You know, and again, because it's pens, right? Like it's not. So if you're in, if you're making um, electrical, you know, outlets or automotive, you know, parts or something like that for engines, there's like safety standards and certain things that have like, you know health and safety impacts to the way they are manufactured, that's really important to standardize. You know, the size of a ink cartridge, it's annoying, but no one's going to have their health or safety endangered by not having standardization here. So it's probably just never really been worth the trouble to go through and do any of that. So yeah. here we And are. anybody that's been listening to the Pencast for, you know, more than 10 episodes will remember how I was dealing with those Pelican Twist converters back when we first said like, hey, we think we're going to carry yeah. these, but I've got to work out this converter thing. I had converters that looked identical. Like I had digital calipers. I'm like, these are the same thing but they didn't fit. Yeah. Like, so one would fit and the other one weren't. And there, I could not tell the two apart. And then finally we ordered the Pelican converter and looking at it, like it's indistinguishable. The opening was just like a couple microns like, bigger than the other one and it fit perfectly. And it's yeah. just, again, no standardization for sure. Yeah, or close enough but not right. truly standard. Yeah. Close enough for fountain pens, right? Yeah. This isn't surgery. Yeah. So it's kind of one of these annoying little things, but you know, over time, the market has pretty much driven companies more towards some collaboration standardization, but I don't know. This might be as good as it gets, Drew, because I don't know. Fountain pens are not even like in their heyday. No. You know, so it's like, is, are, is like increased regulation and standardization like really on the forefront? Probably not maybe the opposite you're gonna have more people just developing new random things i don't know you know what i wonder are people more choosy in particular about fountain pens now than they were when they were in their heyday like i want to say that um it's i kind of feel like they might be because it's it's such it's an hard, intentional it, thing mm. to do now and i think that you've probably got your eyes are on it in a different way it's not a utility anymore it's it's a it's a passion. So I have a thought about that. That's probably a way big deep dive that we don't need that, to go down. But yes, that give me give me a, a quick give me a quick thought, quick thought, Brian, because I am very curious. Proportionally, of the people that use fountain pens, are they in general more particular? Yes, because it is not as a commoditized yeah. of a good as it used to be. I agree. If you're talking overall numbers, though, the number of people that use fountain pens compared to 
how many were using them in their heyday when it was oh. commoditized. Oh god. You no. probably had more people that cared about it, which is why you had more options for custom grinds and flex nibs and all these uh, okay. more obscure types of things because there were just so many more people using pens mm -hmm. and using them for very specific work related purposes as well, certain accounting things and stuff like that. So I would say proportionally, yes, people are more particular now because they have the option to be, whereas, you know, there was more of an industry behind, you know, developing more, uh, whatever, more, yeah. more, more options back then because there were just so many more people that were using them. So anyway, I'm with you. That's a whole discussion that we could have, which would actually, yeah, be no, I'm, I'm with you. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do have another thought around this question, but I'm going to save it because it's actually part of our tip of the week. So everybody that's listening, just peg in your mind this whole standard international long cartridge thing. I have a thought towards that that will be in the tip of the week. So hang tight for one more question, then we'll get there. I think that the title of this episode has to be Consistently Inconsistent. <laughs> that would be fitting. That's like all we've been talking about. That would be fitting. All right. All right. Next question. All right, Brian, we're going to end this with a bang. We are going to end on a biscuit because I have a question here from I dip bananas into coffee and um which is great that's a great handle I, I dip bananas or into coffee asks us a question that is just right up the Brian Goulet alley yeah I saw if this you and I was had, like oh we got it we got to add this one in Jerome yes if you had to narrow your collection to a single pen what would it be and why He's excited, ladies and gentlemen. He likes this one. Brian likes it. This breaks my and, uh, this breaks my brain. Looking at the notes, he's he was it was, it was he was very quickly able to name one pen without any sort of overthinking at all. No, literally, I literally typed out in the first bullet point groan. Yep, because he I did. don't. Yeah. And then at the end, he says, "I'm probably overthinking this." After I wrote out, how many were like nine bullet points or something like that? So first All off, right. first off, I got a, I got a, I got a couple of clarifying questions right. for you, Drew, yes. as one would in my situation. I will, I will put on my I dip bananas into coffee helmet, okay. and I will, I will become the okay. OP. So yes, because I, I need clarifying questions because my answer will be different depending on how these questions are answered. So fair enough. Um, the main question is, am I? Uh, I'm narrowing down, so it has to be obviously something that I currently have in my possession something i currently yeah. own um is that like forever the one pen that i'm going to be able to use or is it basically like you know whatever i had to sell it all off or my house burned down and i only had the one pen on me or whatever scenario that sounds very dramatic and drastic but you know if i had to pare down the whole collection can i reacquire or is that like literally no this is the one pen i have to live with this one pen the rest of my life that you cannot reacquire. I think that I dip bananas into coffee okay. knows that you own a fountain pen company <laughs> and that it would probably be not so hard for you to reacquire your collection. Okay. Um, and probably uh, expense it to. Um, it would you be know, really hard to reacquire the collection. I've, been, I've done it over 13 years. Yeah, that's true. Basically. That's true. But still, no, this is, this is your pen. You get okay. to keep one and that's going to be your pen for all eternity. Okay. Follow up question. Until you die of loneliness. Follow up question. Loneliness. Okay, so I can't I can't go back and reacquire the pens that I've lost. Can I potentially replace the pen that no, I'm using? You only it's have literally one... that one pen, and yes, that's it. Yes, yes. This sucks. It's 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 this best sucks. to keep. I hate this it's... question. <laughs> I don't like this scenario. It's best to keep things like this very very simple. I don't want to answer this question because I just don't like where it puts me in like a headspace. <laughs> You know, I get bothered by a lot of things, like a lot of really stupid things, but the 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 discomfort that you have during these like nonsensical hypotheticals is just it always astonishes me. It's cuz it like makes my brain go into overdrive. I think that's fun though. Isn't it fun no, to kind of like it's just not fun. It's like work. It's just it's painful. <laughs> cuz then my brain goes to like well, what happened to all these pens? And like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> where did they go? Do I okay? Do I pick a pen that like I know is like reliable and durable and all that? But like, what about the ones that are sentimental or the ones that were exclusive and all this? Like, then am I like, do I not care about the other 
people and that I've collaborated with. And, you know, and then I'm like, oh, gosh, do I even remember all these? Why don't I remember these? Aren't these important to me? <laughs> like, this is all the stuff that runs through my head when I get asked these questions. And then I'm like, oh, gosh, have I been asked this question before? Am I going to answer it consistently? And are people going to wow, be like, okay. wow, all Brian's right. really doesn't need this. He answers whatever he wants. He doesn't even care. Does, you know. So, yes, I am overthinking it quite a bit. You are. And I'm sorry. No, it's Do you okay. want me to go first? Would that help I you? I understand that like people want to answer. <laughs> they, they just want a simple answer. So, I know. Well, at this point, here's, here, I'll tell you something that I've learned. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I, I will say that uh, never <laughs> show what annoys or frustrates you because oh. um, as I have, I made this mistake with my, uh, my current employer um, who mm. shall remain nameless, okay. but uh, okay. this employer mm. has chosen to, um, you know, pay attention to the things that uh, really get my goat and oh, uh, often, often utilizes these uh, to, um, to bring about mm. sadness and dismay well you know um, you know drew if i if i was going with like a brene brown analogy here these sound like you're putting up like armor on the the windows of your house (laughs) so if you are walling yourself off to Uh, potential hurt then you are just going to end up alone in the dark inside your house (laughs) you know i would rather have my windows open and yes the breeze is going to blow through and sometimes a squirrel might run in and grab my bagel in my house. <laughs> oh my God. But I'm going to live a more vibrant, exciting and, and fruitful life. If All I keep, right. If I you know what? Windows well, open. All right. Well, <laughs> why don't you put your money where your mouth is, Goulet, and have a vibrant, fun, and exciting answer to this question. Okay. Because you've got your windows all open with no armor, okay. so you enjoy this one. Well, I do appreciate the clarification here because- my, There you go. Well, my, my logic was like, if I could reacquire pens, I would probably pick something that is more sentimental because then I could reacquire the things that are like more readily available and stuff like that. Yeah. But this is more difficult if it's like truly the one pen because now it's like- well, gosh, if I pick something sentimental and that's the only pen I have left, would I want to use that pen? Because then I might break it or drop it or whatever, have it in my cargo pants while I'm mowing my lawn and then I break it or something and then I'd feel even worse. So gosh, this is just such a tough question. <laughs> but I, d- I did actually think of some answers. So some of the ones that run through my mind, I mean, Lamy 2000 is such a solid, <gasps> like dependable, reliable pen. I go to it a lot. It's not particularly sentimental, like any, cause I've actually, I've lost one before and replaced it. I have several in different nib sizes. So I'm not actually sentimental to any one Lamy 2000 pen. It's just a, a good reliable pen. That's like really mm-hmm. durable. I know it's gonna last me a long time, but. Good workhorse. Yeah. Um, my original like Visconti Homo sapiens bronze age with a fine nib, that one's pretty good. I've carried that one a lot. It's pretty durable as well. Um, it's well loved. That one could be, it's well loved. So it could that be sentimental. Is, is, that, is that clip completely bronze yet? Oh, I mean, I've never polished it, so it's pretty. No, no, I mean, like, the, the, the lacquer, I, every time I see it, the lacquer is almost a little bit more worn Yeah, and yeah, this is before they were, like, laser engraving or doing, like, any of the enamel infilling. It was literally just, like, something that was, a, I don't know the process, but it was, like, applied yeah. to it. Like, half of it's gone on one side, and the other side's, like, got some cracks in it, but it's generally held up okay, considering what I put it through. Yeah, I know, you've been it's using that well. a lot. So, like, I could do that one, but um, I don't know. I think the one... I'm debating between two of them, honestly, um, which are both ones that I really enjoy writing with, have some sentimental value, but I didn't have develop either one of them. So I literally just can't, like if I'm trying to pick one pen that I've had a hand in either developing or an exclusive or something like that, I I, I actually really struggle with that because I'm like, how do I even can't begin? Tell. I also can't remember half of them, so I'd have to like actually look through my collection and see. Um, so I'm actually not gonna go that route. Um, so I have two pens. Uh, the one that I'll lean towards initially. So I have a, um, I have a Sailor King of Pens that was, uh, it's a blue with clear finials. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I bought that in Japan. It was not available in the US. So I was in Japan, which I obviously have memories associated with that. It was my most challenging, and I'll, I'll say it wasn't that hard, but it was a most intimidating pen purchasing experience that I've ever had. Because literally I had left the group is when I went to, when I went with Platinum for their hundredth anniversary, mm-hmm. but like we had downtime and stuff like that. And I literally was in Japan by myself 
walking down the Ginza in Tokyo, I don't speak Japanese or anything close. So I'm wandering down the streets with my phone and like Google Translate. And I somehow found out there was going to be this like pen event there at one of the, I think it was at Marzen or something like that. And they had this, all these pen companies. And I saw this like, you know, it's blue and I love it. And I, I did not have a king of pens. It's got the bicolored nib, which just looks awesome. And I bought this pen using Google Translate in Japan in like the basement of this. Stuff. So it was like, just, it was a very interesting pen buying experience for me. Normally I'm just like, I tell my team like, oh, I'll go ahead and pull this one for me and I'll go and grab it off the shelf whenever I'm in the office, you know, and it's no big deal. But this was like by far the most out of my way that I've ever gone to buy a pen. Um, so that was just very memorable, but also that pen, I just love the way it writes. And that's a just a, the King of Pens is a fantastic pen, especially that broad. That's a good one. And it's been, I'm, I'm sure it's not made anymore, right? I have no idea. I don't even know what it's called. I don't know really much of anything other than I saw it. And this is before we had picked Sailor back up. So I actually had a little bit of conflict in my own heart, you know, because I have so many pens as it is. So I will often not necessarily buy pens that we don't carry for one, because just practicality, I have so many already, but then, you know, we buy obviously, you know, wholesale through the ones, the brands that we carry. And if we don't, I'm paying retail price. So I have to like really want it to pay that retail price when I'm not used to doing that. Um, so I did that, I did that in this case, but I'd had, you know, no indication that we would ever carry Sailor in the future when I bought that pen. So I bought it just purely because it was a pen that I wanted to have and uh, made the trip memorable for me. And then it just made it that much sweeter when we reunited with Sailor. So that's a good one. I'm, I'm, I don't so know how your second one is going to be even close to that. Well, so like that one, I guess, has a lot of like meaningfulness to it. Yeah, and it's got I just, a whole story. I really love writing with that pen. The other one is less of a personal story, but though it still has some. Um, so the, the next one that is kind of contending with a little bit, but probably wouldn't wouldn't quite come there because uh, anyway, so the other one I have is a new Namiki Custom Impressions, which is basically like a Pilot Custom 74. It's almost identical in that way, except it's made of celluloid, true celluloid. Mm -hmm. So it was available in the 90s. I wasn't into pens at that time, but I discovered this. Pilot has all kinds of stuff they've made in the past that is like on the DL and you know, you just like randomly see a picture online one day and you're like, what is that? I didn't know they made that, but they've been around for over a hundred years. Um, so I discovered this thing and I was like, that's amazing. So when I went to actually tour Pilot USA, I was like talking about this thing and they were showing us like where they have the pens and all this kind of stuff. And they showed us this like, basically like parts drawer where they like will repair things and stuff like that. And I saw in the parts drawer, they had parts for the custom impressions. And I was like, you guys need to bring these back. These are so amazing. And they were like, well, it's a celluloid. They don't make it anymore, blah, 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 blah. So we really can't do that. But they were like, we might be able to build one based out of the parts that we have. Because they're like, it's been discontinued so long. We're probably not going to have to service these. And they had you know, enough to service whoever. And I was like, oh my gosh, if you could do that. So they actually, while I was visiting there, they they basically assembled one from spare parts for me and I acquired it on that trip. So it's like, that was like, okay, that's yeah. cool. That's really cool. You could, but you can still kind of find those around. So like technically you could acquire one at some point, but they're just really, really hard to come by. So I love the custom, the custom 74 is like, it was my first gold nib pen. So there's a little bit of sentiment there, but it's like a more beautiful version of a custom 74 that, you know, also has some meaningfulness to it. So it's, I'm really torn between the two of those, but you know, if I probably had to choose, I might go with the sailor just because, you know, there's a little more wrapped into that, that uh, is personally meaningful. Plus it's a larger pen, so comfortable yeah. to write with. So I just, I really enjoy that particular pen as well. So. There you go. That's it's always exhausting. You I know what? Like, you know what? I yeah, spent like you spent thirty minutes just thinking about this question. <laughs> it was just, I, it was, but you know, I get to go down memory lane. It's also kind of fun too. But yes, it is fun, Brian. <laughs> this is fun. We're gonna make this fun for you. Okay. Eventually, you will look forward to these. I'm actually kind of tired after talking through all that because, like, 
so many like memories <gasps> flood back to me when I start talking about this kind of stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh, like it was 2015 when I went to Pilot USA. That was seven years ago. Like, holy crap, has it really been Man, seven years since I went down that there? That's crazy. And like, I was talking with Pilot about going to Japan and all that kind of stuff. And like, I was so close to planning a trip with them. And then COVID hit, and I have no mm -hmm. idea. I'm hoping that I can do it one day, but it's like, you know, we were talking about it seven years ago when I was down there and I'm like, oh man. Uh, but anyway, so who knows? So this is the reason why I struggle making these decisions because I literally just get flooded with so many just memories of our business and everything that happens when I start talking about, you know, individual pens and it just escalates the, the, you know, the memories when people ask me to like narrow it down. So I think what, I, what I've decided I'm gonna do from now on, since it's too much, too much work in my brain, uh, I'm just gonna start saying the first thing that comes to mind and I'm gonna just throw out any thoughts of consistency from video to video. <laughs> so from here on in the future, I'm just gonna answer it for whatever reason and whatever comes to mind and I'll answer it differently the next time. And yeah. you'll just get different answers every time because I think that Absolutely. Pr it probably matters more to everybody than like, oh, six years ago, Brian said his favorite pen was blah, 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 blah. And now he said it's different now. He's a liar. That's like what goes in the back of my mind of like, am I being I mean, you are a liar. But, Absolutely. I'm disappointed. I mean, I'm always authentic in the moment. It's just, I sometimes <laughs> of course, don't. No. I sometimes don't remember you, I, things or I no, no one new cares. pens. Or no one cares. Okay. As long as, I have permission, all good. as long as I have permission to be inconsistent without Absolutely. it seeming like I have a lack of integrity, then I can, no, no, then no. I can have an easier time answering these Have things. integrity about other things. <laughs> this doesn't matter. Okay. There are, there, are thi there are things where integrity matters. This That's is true. not one no of one's them. Ever this like, is just... No one's ever called me out and been like, Brian, you blah, blah, blah. You said this six years ago. And it's like, okay, yeah, it doesn't actually... Matter yeah, that no, one. You no said a lot no of things. You no said a lot of things. Six yeah. No, honestly, if people wanted to pick on some weird things that you've said, then go. You've got you know a decade of videos to go back to the <laughs> earlier days. Like, why'd you call this custom seventy four sexy, Brian? That's weird. You know, <laughs> you know, you can find them if you look for it. Yeah, um, I've said some. But, uh, I've said some weird stuff over the years. <laughs> it's all good, man. It's all good. <laughs> And you know what? That's that's the that's the great thing about learning and you know reflecting is if you're not looking back and saying that you said something dumb a couple of years ago, then you're not growing and advancing in your life. That's mm. a sign of advancement and worldliness. I say. There you go. Anyway, the, win um, the window is open on my emotional house. There we go. Me too. Me there you too. Go. All right. So, so Drew, your answer is way shorter. What would, what well, would you yeah. Pick? I mean. <laughs> yeah, so I actually, it, it was tough because I have some of those Namiki custom impressions as well. And it it would hurt me to lose those. It would hurt me to lose a lot of my pens. Like, True. it would crush me. Um, I have a lot of very sentimental pens, and uh, most of my favorite pens are favorite because of sentimental reasons. Yeah, I was going to say, you've, you haven't required a... You haven't acquired many pens just for the sake of acquiring them. Most of them have been because they are very meaningful. Yes, exactly. Um, so right off the bat, I have a custom 912, a Pilot custom 912 that is currently out getting um, a custom Urushi job to it. Um, it has been out for about a year. It's taken a while. That's wow. it's, it's an independent thing. Um, I'm not worried about it. It's going to be a while. But um, that one probably would be my number one just because I've, you know, it has a customized nib to it. Mm. It has an aftermarket feed. It's now getting a rouge. So this is like, this thing is so much my pen now because I've had so much done to it that is not stock from Pilot. So I'd have to keep this one. However, I don't even have this pen right now, so I didn't pick it because it is just <laughs> currently not even in my possession. So Ooh, that's a hack. That's a hack, Drew. So it's not in your collection right now. So that means that whatever pen you choose... This one would then like come into your being afterwards, and you would have like a loophole. Oh, maybe, like maybe, in the question. <laughs> maybe. So, but I also didn't have a picture to take of it because I mean, oh, it yeah. looks like it. I don't. Yeah. So, um, so I went with a different pen. Um, I went with uh this pen here, and I'll take a picture of that. But this is I don't even know what kind of pen this is, Brian. It looks kind of like a custom seventy four. It's a mm -hmm. pilot, but it is green Urushi with the uh, um. I don't know what sort of something nerdy design this is. It's the one where it's got like the bumps and then they file down the bumps. So, so what's left yeah, is like a different yeah. color under different color. The talk, um, talking nerdy, is that what it's called? Some, I don't know. I wasn't confident enough to say it, but um, it's a beautiful pen. And it is uh, one of my only Urushi pens, but it was given to me. And it is a, a pretty rare pen from what I understand. I don't even know the specifics of how these pens were made other than that they were made by Pilot 
And from what I understand, they were not um, sent to retailers, but I know, I believe from the person who gifted this to me that they were made specifically for Andy Lambrow and mm. he sold them for a little while, but I don't, I don't think that there are very many produced at all. Um, but I have one, it is very special to me and it was a gift from a dear friend. So I, I think that uh, just from a rarity standpoint, from a sentimentality standpoint, this one would be it. And also it meant a lot to, from, to the person who gave it to me and mm. it was given very solemnly and I, I I respect that and I don't think that I could ever part ways with it for that reason so in, in case um, anybody in the audience is wondering it was not me I don't think of drew that fondly no 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 a, um no 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 <laughs> I, I just have to tell Brian I'm keeping I'm keeping something and if he doesn't yell at me I get to keep it yeah. um but <laughs> <laughs> but uh no that so that would be it uh there are dozens of others that i just don't want to even think about because if i think about it i'm going to turn into brian and we don't lord knows we don't need that um we don't need more so we don't have time we don't have time in the paintcast for two of them we don't need more of those. so that's gonna that's gonna be it yeah it, it writes like a 74 um i believe it's got the same size nip yep um yeah i think but, it's like uh, i want to say it's a custom 743 that seems well, like it's, about that size. It's it's um, I don't know. It doesn't have a band, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. If know. If it was an Andy um, Lambrow thing, that it might have been like they used some of the guts of it, but then you know, I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. Cool, cool, Pendrew. Pick one that you don't know about and that no one can recognize. <laughs> well, I have a I have a seven four. No, it's definitely not a seven forty three, Brian, because I have a seven forty two here. Uh huh. And it's uh, slimmer than that. Huh. So it's definitely it's okay. it's slimmer than it's it's probably a yeah it's probably the more of a seventy four shape than All a right. uh, All right. than either of the other two. So I guess it's not it's neither because it doesn't have any trim on it. Uh, it doesn't have any center band or a uh, yeah I don't know, a, I don't know fin- what to do fin- with that. band. Yeah. So it's a thing. If anybody knows about it, let me know because. Hmm always looking for that there you go but yeah i also have this uh this is the custom impressions le which is so i wonder if andy lambrow's book like fountain pens of japan i wonder if that would be in there it might be it might be i have that book we'll have to to look at it sometime this is this is the uh um one that brian was talking about the namiki custom impressions and then this is his is a different color his is like a purpley blue um i have a couple different colors yeah yeah and then this is the custom impressions le which is larger and a flat top so I don't even want to look at these because in this hypothetical, they would be leaving me and that makes mm-hmm. me want to cry. So mm-hmm. not going to think about it. Yes. It is painful, isn't it? It is. All right. Let's move on from this question. I'm, emotion- Let's. I'm emotionally traumatized. <laughs> All right. We're, uh, we got a tip of the week. Let's do it. All right. So I alluded a minute ago as we were talking about standard international long cartridges that I had a tip of the week. Uh, and my tip of the week is cartridge related. So, um, you know, truth be told, we came up with an initial list of tips of the week. We are nearing the end of that list, so we could use some more. So if you have any, please let us know. Um, but yeah, we got a, we got a couple more weeks here. So we've, we're not like on the edge of the cliff, but we're, we can see it, it's within sight. Um, so the tip of the week that I have is related to standard international short and long cartridges. So as I was thinking about why don't they make more international long cartridges? I think honestly, part of it is because this little hack that I have for you today, this tip of the week, actually negates most of the use of even having a long cartridge at all. And mm, in some ways, it's, tell. in some ways, it's even better. And you know this, Drew, because you've done this. Don't tell me um, what I've done. I mean, I'm going to call you out if I see you doing something. <laughs> I'm going to let you know it. Okay, so you have. Unfortunately, I don't have a standard long cartridge, but imagine the exact same shape, but twice as long. So we talked about how the fact that the back of the long cartridge is flat like this, and it can cause you some issues on certain pens. Well, since a short cartridge is basically half of a long cartridge, you can actually take two short cartridges and you can put them in a pen that would normally fit a long cartridge. All you gotta do is take your second cartridge, you flip it over, so put them butt to butt, And then you put it inside your pen. So I have a Monteverde Ritma here, which, you know, any any pen that's long enough to fit in, you know, a standard size converter will be able to do this. 
even if you have some of these weird circumstances where it won't fit the long cartridge because the butt's too fat on the back of the cartridge, because you're turning the second cartridge around and you have the narrow end, you end up with a similar effect to like what you have with the converter where it's narrower. So it's gonna fit in any pen where the converter would fit. And you basically have a backup cartridge. And then you just install your, your short cartridge as you normally would. And then they will fit in there butt to butt you'll be able to have the exact same amount of ink as you would if you had a long cartridge, except you are not going to have those same fit, potential fit issues and your cartridge, you're going to be using it quicker. So the ink and like it drying out and stuff like that's not going to be as much. So you literally don't really have anything to lose other than the temporary inconvenience of when you're, used up a short cartridge, you have to pull it out and put in the other cartridge, which takes maybe 10 seconds. And then you keep on plugging. So it's a great hack for if you want to be able to basically double the ink capacity of your short cartridges. And uh, you don't have to worry about any of this long cartridge nonsense. So that is my tip of the week. I double, love it. Double up your short shorties. Double, double up your shorties butt to butt. There you go. That's all you got to say. All right. That's our tip of the week for this week. I don't know what we're even talking about now. Um, but we do have a pen spotlight for you on the Sailor Pro Gear Slim Mini. So when Drew proposed this one, I was like, can we pick a pen that has more names to it, please? Because this is a lot of words to get in there. But in concept, it's very simple, right? It's basically a Sailor Pro Gear. It's just really short. Like pretty much, right? Is that what we're I love about? it. I love this pen. It's, I want one. It's so it's so stubby. It's so I just know, like... but it's 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 like the E ninety five S where it's it's stubby when it's capped, but then when it's posted, it's normal. So No, you can't no, no, can't my, do that. My Oh my god, you make it look here, like a jeez. It's like I mean liter literally it doesn't even fit in the like web of my forefinger and thumb no that won't work like if, with I'm, you at if all. I'm holding the grip of the pen i literally am only holding the grip of the pen my goodness which is pretty weird unless i do this kind of a thing which makes me cramp so i have to post it otherwise it's pretty much unusable uh, bah, bah, bah. now drew i have a question about this yeah. this pen for you and just yeah. pens in general that have screw posting mm-hmm how do you feel about that? Do you find I love it? You find that securing? Like you like yeah. how see I find it annoying. I love I and, and it, for me, I'm always like worried that I'm going to end up wearing and tearing the back end of my pen with repeated posting. I'm like, am I supposed to do this? Ooh, I don't know. Do I really need to? Mm. I don't know. Should I post? But when the threads are there, it's like, please post me. Come on. I'm ready. I'm here for you. The, this this is supposed to be posted. I like that clarity i like the pen telling me what it wants and i appreciate that communication when the pen communicates with me like that hmm. it's like okay well then let's do this let's post let's post up um hmm. and that pen you have to do it with and the twisby mini is the yeah. same way i dig it on that it we is. talked about that a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. another little stumpy thing that and i maybe 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 it's uh to say like hey i'm pretty much useless unless you post me um I mean, I wouldn't say that. I mean, it's pretty small. You kind of have, have to post it. If you have much smaller, if you have smaller hands, you're not going to have as much an issue. It's probably not going to be as comfortable, but yeah. you probably will at least be able to function with it. With me, it's it's pretty much non-functional. Yeah, I love the pen though. Now, my only thing with the uh, Pro Gear Mini is that I don't love the colors. I yeah, they're, like they're I they're I, a bit I, forgettable. I need some silver hardware brian goulet i need yeah. some chrome trim i the, the whole gold trim mm. thing just i think it looks good on some of these colors okay like the the pink one i think it looks good black obviously is just fine right no they don't have a black they have puff brown how did i not know about puff brown mm. it doesn't look brown it looks black i gotta look at this puff brown here Look on our website. This thing looks black. I'm looking. I'm looking. I wanted to like it because it said puff brown. I'm like, yeah, please. Yeah, it, puff it, does, brown. it does just look black, doesn't it? It does. I mean... It might be a little brown. That's like dark, dark brown. That's some dark brown. 
that's pretty much just black. If you look at the environmental images that we have, like yeah, I'm looking at the, the environmental black, on like the black mat that it's sitting on. You yeah. can see that it's it leans brown, but mm. yeah, I don't you know. gotta commit to being brown. Take it from me. I mean, I'll say like these colors are not necessarily ones that would jump out to us, but I could, I think they would be appealing to some. They're just more they're more like kind of pastel, a little more subtle. Yeah, some color. some of them some of them are okay. Okay, that li that brown needs to be lighter, so it's a true brown, so it yells brown. But I like the name <laughs> Puff Puff Brown. That makes me happy. It's like it's brown, but it's not really proud of being brown. So it like right, has like one on. foot in the black, you know, right, paint come camp, on and one now. in the brown. The dark come blue, on, the dark brown. blue is okay. Dark blue is good. Dark blue's good, but it would look better with chrome trim. Am I right? I think the white looks good with gold trim. I think the pink looks good with gold trim. Everything else needs silver. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, yeah. in general, I'm much more of a, you know, silver colored trim on almost everything. I think I think gold looks good with white. I think gold looks good with earth tones. With greens and browns, I think it slaps. I think, I think it's great with I those. I think silver but... looks better with white. I think I think almost it, everything looks better with, yeah. with I, I silver. I mean, I can see that. I, but I, I do, I think that, you know, for, for whatever reason, white and gold just has a vibe to it that white and silver don't have. You know, like white, white and gold, it's its own vibe. Yeah, white okay. and silver does not have an established vibe, you know. Okay, kind of like Twi like Twisby's white and rose gold. Like that's a vibe. That's a very specific. That's rose vibe. gold. That's different. It's, you can't but, even. But it's, you can't even. I know. Compare. It's, okay. Okay. It's right. not the same at all. It's not the same. Yellow gold but... and rose gold. That's as different as yellow gold and silver. Sorry. No, it's not as different. Oh yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, you're you're probably right. But but I get what you're saying. It's not some, the same some vibe. Some rose gold can be pretty dang yellow. Which then I would say that's not really yeah. rose gold but whatever yeah but i do like the pen i like the fact that um you know what i would love i would love if um pilot came out with a so this is sailors you know pro gear shortened uh -huh. what if pilot came out with like a heritage shortened how cool would that Ooh, be i love i love the idea of these bigger like a, a custom 7.4 Yes, please. <laughs> yes, I love that. Thank you. I love the idea of these. Be, yes, be I think that'd it's great tight. to take a well-known model of a very popular pen brand and just mm. give you a pocket version of that well-known model. You don't need to make a, a whole separate model as a pocket pen. Take something that's already established and just shorten it a little bit. Boom. I, I think that's great. I, I, I do hmm. see the value here. And um, Well, okay, so the only thing that I would say is that it does not fit a full-size converter. You have to have the Sailor Mini converter, which is pretty mini. Does it fit a? Does it fit? It doesn't fit a cartridge. It'll fit a cartridge. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Honestly, dude, but, you, I but have it won't been, fit a full-size converter. So I don't like, even care. I have been so, dude. <laughs> you don't even, I, You don't care. What are you talking about? I you have been. Care? I have been. I have been so anti-cleaning pens lately, Brian. I, I cleaned all the ten pens that I was complaining about last uh -huh. time. Yeah, and I'm just so mad at. Why are you I, mad? I hate cleaning pens. I hate. That's why I have the three, Brian, so I don't have to clean pens. And I'll tell you, you have to clean just, pens just as much, no matter how many you have but, used up. No way, Habababa. With refilling cartridges you can just blast that thing with a syringe and you're good blast the cartridge with a syringe blast the it, it's so much easier to and you don't have to deal with you know behind the piston getting funky or like an extra little step because so many converters have a weird funky step in them pilot lami lami like there's always ink in the bottom of the converter like where that black plastic thing is that little thing you know yeah, you can't you just, ever get that clean yeah you can you just gotta yeah, you have to pop you have to like take do you know how no. hard it is to take this part out no it's super yeah, hard yes i know but it's super you don't hard to, you don't have to do that you don't have to do all how? that what 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 Okay. All I'm saying is that that could be a future. That could be a future. Uh, all I'm saying is that refilling actually. cartridges, refilling cartridges is so easy. It's so convenient. You don't have to deal with funky piston gook. And then if you are annoyed by how dirty it gets, you just throw it away and use another one. I, I'm 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 in love with yeah. Refilling but if you change right colors, now. you got to clean out the pen anyway. Like yeah. I just it's it's still easier. Just a little bit easier. I don't know. I'm just I'm. I would debate simplest. that one on you. I don't oh, think, you would. How surprising. That I doesn't sound like you at all. I really don't think it's much harder to clean out a converter than to clean out a cartridge. In some cases, no. In Lamy's cases, in, yes. In Pilot's cases, yes. 
Sailor has a very basic converter with no steppage going on, no funky inserts. It's just a big old wide open mouth. Lamy is a pain in the butt. Pilot's a pain in the butt. I think your your definition of what's a pain is different. Platinum's than mine. easy because it disassembles really well, but everything else, no. The others used to disassemble better, but no, I know Lamy used to disassemble better. You could just kind of yank them out. Now they're yeah really hard. I mean, it still yanks, but it's not as easy. They're like a tighter no. fit. You have to like really yank, not just kind of yank. Yeah, like, it's kind of annoying. Yeah, I feel like I'm gonna break it. Well, even still, like that front little black piece that's on the uh -huh. the part that fits onto the post that yeah is not a part of any of that that you just took off. Like you got to pull that thing out separately. I know. I, I would always take this back half and then just shove that oh, out through yeah, the you could do that. front. I, yeah. I did. I took like a paper clip and I like bent the end of it to get like a little, a little like. Oh, you hook it and a pull? little J hook and then oh, pull it out. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Now I know I can come out, but you like I shouldn't have to do that. You don't actually have to do that, Drew. But that's going. That's going to be my hack. I'm gonna write that down. All right. Tip of the week, Lamy. All right. Well, maybe maybe you can bring me back to the converter zone because right now I'm just like a cartridge refilling man. I just, I just, I'm just so. I just want. To not have to ever clean pens. Okay. It's like cutting my grass. I know you like it. I hate it. Don't want to do it. Oh, we're going to talk about that when we get to the what's happening. I don't want to hear about cutting grass. Oh, I've cutting done grass. so much yard stuff. Oh, oh it's God. so good. I'm going to talk about it a lot. See, yard, some yard there. stuff is okay. Oh, we got I got yard stuff. Oh, All right, we're getting well. There. We're getting there. Anyway, that's the pen spotlight. Yes. No, oh, hey, we are, we, look at this. Now we get into what's happening. That's our next section, Drew. All right, since we already have uh, kind of preempted this section, um, I do want to say that uh, I do have some new pens inked up, Brian. Um, uh -huh. And I tried new inks this time. New inks that I have never used before. And I mentioned uh, on a previous episode that I wanted to try Sailor uh, Tokiwa Matsu when we were talking mm -hmm. about the best yep. greens. And I'm working on, I've, I'm using that and loving it. I'm also trying Colorverse a signy and i'm loving that as well it's uh got a little bit of a shimmer to it but uh the color of shimmer uh in my experience hasn't been super cloggy so i'm, I'm enjoying that one yeah and then i'm using another one i can't talk about yet because it's just in japan and it hasn't made its way over here but i'm mm. also enjoying that as well so new inks never before tried for me i'm really enjoying them um and you know what else i'm using brian what are you using i'm using the twisby go okay yeah I'm just like, you know what? Let's go. Let's go, go. Let's go, go. Go to the go, go. Yeah. Um, and. What are your thoughts? Uh, How do you I, I'm, I'm not into it. <laughs> I'm not into it. I'm like, <laughs> I thought you were going to go the way of the swipe and be like, no, this no, is like my go-to thing now. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. The whole time I'm like, why isn't this a swipe? This is stupid. Why is it, This could be a swipe right now and it's not. Um, so. A, found out that you definitely can't fill this thing with a, an ink sample, Brian. So that was, uh, mm. um, that was the, unfortunate. The, yeah, the, the, the top of the grip no, is too No, this wide. plunger thing. It's neat. It's cute, but... Yeah, it's a bit mm. aggressive. Yeah. It is. And, you know, just like I get annoyed by the Con 70, I'm just not into the whole push button thing. I'm like, if I want a, a suck filler, have it be like just... <laughs> I want to just draw the ink up. This whole button Suck thing, filler. like, yeah, like the, the this the button thing. Like, what is that? Like, am I going up? Am I going down? Am I sucking in or blowing out? Do I ha I have to do both? Like, it, it's just obnoxious. It's obnoxious and unnecessary, and I don't want it. Platinum used to have this converter that was just like a draw filler, had a little button on it, and you just go whoop, yeah, and it just was a piston that moved up. Like, that's all I need. I don't need the thing. Parker has that too. It's like a. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's technically a piston filler, but it's like a right. It's like a it's slide. Just, it's like a. It's like that's a, all you need. It's like one of those whistles where you're like, yes, whoosh, whoosh, exactly, exactly, yeah. yes. And that's all I need. That's all I need. It doesn't need to do this thing. Just like the Con Seventy, you don't know. It's it's just overly complicated. It doesn't need to be. Anyway, so I'm enjoying those, despite you know trying trying new things, new horizons this week, Brian. That's Look my you. Look at you. Look at you. I tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, slide um, whistle, slide whistle. That's what it's called. Yeah. Beep. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned last week that uh, when I tried to predict how my weekend would have gone during our all Q&A episodes, I yes, said that we're, go we're it, going to... A because it totally 
would have happened by the time that it broadcast. Well, I was wrong, Brian. We did indeed go to the aforementioned comic convention, our our, our first one. Or just We just kind of wanted to go and see what the deal was. Okay. And uh, Archer said that he wanted to wear his Halloween costume. He was the superhero Nova from the Marvel Universe. I don't know anything about Nova, um, but uh, he, he likes him because of a different video game. But anyway, he wore the costume. He was a champ about it. He nice. showed up. He he did the whole thing. Um, it was crazy busy there. We just kind of like, yeah, like people how many watched. Pe- how many people were um, there if you had to guess? Oh, God, I don't know. Like, it, you, you've seen the place. It's so freaking massive. Well, I mean, um, it depends. Cause, so this was at the, the Greater Richmond Convention Center, which is 700,000 oh, yeah. square feet in yeah, its entirety. I had no, I had but, no like, frame of reference. <laughs> it, it was busy. But there's, it like, different busy. rooms and stuff that they can break. Was it bigger than, like, a pen show? Oh, God, yes. So Absolutely. it's, like, not even on the same scale. No, no, way bigger okay. than a pen show. I would, imagine, yeah. I would imagine it would be pretty big. Like, yeah. 10,000 people, maybe? I don't know. Like, the, the, there were very few times where I was walking at full pace. There was just a lot of stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. Wow. It was like that sort of crowded. Okay, so, okay. Um, but anyway, we got to um, my, uh, I have a distant cousin, second removed, I don't know, something. But uh, he built an R2-D2, so we were there. We, he, he came with his R2-D2, and uh, he was driving he, around with little... What do you mean he built an R2-D2? Out of what? Out of R2-D2 parts, I guess. I don't know. Maybe 3D printed, probably some wood, some... Oh, just plastic? plastic? Like, scrapped it together with something. Uh, however people build them. Like, I don't I think, know. I'm getting confused because I've also been to that same convention center for, like, Lego events before. So when you say, like, built oh, yeah, something, no, no, I'm no. thinking, like, built out of Lego. No, no, no. An actual <laughs> droid it spins its head around, drives around. Wow. Like, people do that. Yeah, it's a thing. Oh, um, okay. So he was there with that. We got some good pictures and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was... It was Pretty good. And then I went to um, Boulevard Burgers and Brews over by the movie theater on Boulevard okay. for the first time. Never been there. It was there. fantastic. Oh, my yeah. God. Got the best best burger. Mm. It had uh, a hunk of ham on there, some jalapenos, the beef, and then uh, some chorizo sausage and a fried egg and lettuce. Wow, Just that's a, a lot. That's a lot oh, on a burger. It was glorious. I'm not going to feel mag- about that. Was, I'm not going to feel oh, about you, that. You, sh- you should feel good about it because it was Is amazing. it a burger at that point? That feels more... Absolutely, it's a burger. What are you talking about? Anything between two pieces of bread is a burger. Was the burger the burger primary sandwich. component of it or were the, all the other things, did they add up to more than the burger was? Uh, in terms of weight or... Yeah, weight. Diameter or... <laughs> Wait, vol- yeah, wait, vo- I don't volume, know. volumetrically. I don't know, but it's still a burger. Even if it was 100% bologna, it'd still be a burger. Oh, did you hear the country burger. come out when I? Did you hear the country come out when I, I said burger? Oh my god! I did hear it out. Probably because you said bologna. You probably said bologna, and it just oh, like tripped your brain. Yeah, seriously, I said the word bologna, and the South came out. Yeah. Oh, god. it's funny. Drew will randomly bologna burger. Drew and I, Drew and I both grew up in the Central Virginia area, which is in the south but it's not that south compared to many other states that are beneath virginia but it is funny because it comes out every now and then with drew yeah a little less so with me my parents are from new england so i I I didn't i didn't hear as much of the southern language in the family i don't have like a a particular twangy family member that i can think about that has like a really strong accent i'm I'm sure we all have strong accents compared to somebody from the west coast but Mm. But every now and then, yep, it it, it definitely comes out. Yeah, burger, My, burger, bologna burger, <laughs> bologna you know, burger. I, I I know when I do it every time. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, it was um, I had my birthday event. My wife mm-hmm. got me this awesome Tie Fighter and Death Star shirt and was, a gift yeah. card. I couldn't tell those to, were Tie Fighters. I thought they were like little bat symbols or something. Just at yeah, a distance, still but. cool. And she got me a gift card, Brian, to mm. the Converse website, so oh, that yeah. I can design my own. Converse All Star, oh. and I have no idea what I'm going to do. I've spent so much time on that website, not at work. I can promise. You, can you design um, some that have some uh, support, like on the? No, on the, you don't need support. Sole? It is the perfect. It is the perfect shoe. Ones that don't, you don't feel need support. like you're walking it puts on you, an, uh, on pavement. You are in tune with with terra firma, Brian. You, you need to feel. Nothing. You're. You need. You're. you're <laughs> you got like cloth holding. Yes, like that's all of, you need. Like a plank of wood to the bottom that's of your foot. All you that's need. what it feels like. No, it's all natural, Brian. I don't know. You need it's to, therapeutic. You need it's to, healthy to feel bumps on your feet. You need to put like a weight vest on that weighs 100 pounds and then walk around in those shoes <laughs> and then tell me how you think. Because that's what it's like with me. That's what it's like being Brian Goulet. 
Uh, fair enough. Tell fair me how enough. Much but I, I like. There's so many <laughs> options. I don't know what to do. Like I was like, oh, blue, but I have too many blues. And then I was doing mm. a uh, a Neapolitan ice cream one with like pink, brown, white. I'm like, that looks oh. cool. No, it doesn't at all. It's disgusting. So <laughs> I don't know. I might mm. go. I actually, I was thinking about doing a predominantly brown one because that yay. would make sense. And yep. then with like a black tongue and then green lining. And you know what it looked like? It looked like those shoes that you got. Those um those Gary V shoes. Uh-huh. Kind of like, aren't there? Some, aren't, isn't there some brown on those? Um, or is it just green and black? No, green and black. Oh, okay, never mind. It reminded me of them for some reason, but yeah, I don't know. So I'm sick with opportunity here uh, with mm. my gift card, and I'll probably never buy anything just because I'll never be able to make up my mind. Mm. So I would, I, would yeah. know, I wouldn't know anything about that. I'm very decisive when it comes to narrowing down choices of things. I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what's in my world. Nice. All is good. All is good in Brown Town. Nice. Glad to hear it. Um, yeah, in Goulayville, things have been going pretty well too. We've had some kid birthday parties. Um, Joseph, oh. yeah, Joseph, his birthday rolled around with Omicron was in full swing. So we basically were like, nope, you're not seeing anybody or doing anything. So mm -hmm. his, he has a couple of friends at his birthdays, their birthdays are slightly after his. So his friends recently had their birthday parties and then we, Rachel and I were like, oh yeah, we never like did anything for Joseph. So they were like, let's do something but he's like super low-key like he's gonna yeah. he's gonna have a couple of friends over. he he will have had a couple of friends over by the time this video publishes um to just like eat pizza and play video games and he's oh, that's perfect literally just like that is that is literally all he wants to do in life so he'll be thrilled to do that, that on his birthday amazing. he'll be thrilled to do that on any day of the week um so that'll be fun and then uh, I will have gone to a work conference by the time this publishes, my first one in a while. Um, so I anticipate, I will actually, I'll be back by the time that this one publishes, even though it's like a week and a half away. But anyway, um, so yeah, uh, that should be fun. It's a networking thing for like e-commerce focused people. So uh, it's always a good time. It's a, it's a small group and all that. So i um, not having to travel too far. So that's kind of cool. I'll be tired and inspired from that. Um, and then I've had lots of outdoor adventures, Drew doing all the outdoorsy things because as you well know springtime is rolling around here and that means that uh you get pollen and bugs and mm -hmm. grass and yard things that start to happen and it's like we've lived at this place for 10 years and pretty much every year i'm like you know what i need to aerate in the spring i need to like i do like some of the yardy things that you you know hear about or read about or watch youtube videos about with lawn have care have nightmares about have nightmares about i'll be honest with you i watch like some lawn care youtube videos and stuff and there's like some real sciencey stuff that you get into there's people like measuring the ph of their this and that and talking about real mowers and lawn leveling and, all. and i'm like what is any of this like, and it's so variable depending on your climate and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, this is exhausting. Like, I just don't, I just want like a relatively smooth yard that I'm not like bouncing around and tripping over myself as I walk through and whatnot. There you go. And trying to mow. And I want it to not be dirt. So like when it's summertime and I'm mowing it, I'm not like choking on dust, you know, because that's definitely a thing. So as long as it has what I call country grass, which is something green that covers the dirt. I don't care if it's crabgrass or weeds or whatever. As long as it covers the go. dirt, I am happy and I will mow it. <laughs> really don't care what it looks like, but um, you know, I've been trying to like aerate and do some of that stuff, but I've got a, I've got a fairly decent sized yard and it's surrounded by trees and woods and stuff. And I'm like trying to like actually make this like a really nice yard. I would, I would probably literally have to spend thousands of dollars a year and so much time and so much time so and much like, time and no oh, one cares God. like and it's no one sees it well and i don't have irrigation or anything like that so i'd either have to like have sprinklers like everywhere or run irrigation which would be like i don't even know how much i'm like this is just no it's easier just to not care so um my my caring about my yard definitely has a like a pretty firm cutoff point but anyway still you know i'm trying to do a lot of that and now we had the time change, which makes a big difference. So now it's like I can have dinner and there's still some light out. So while the kids are doing whatever the heck, homework and all that kind of stuff, I can go out and I can be working on yard stuff before the sun goes down. So that's a lot of what I've been doing. Um, I did get something recently called a lawn roller. 
which is a new thing that I'm trying mm -hmm. out because part of the challenge I have is I have moles and rabbits and stuff and they'll like go underground and they they dig in the ground and you get like these oh yeah yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. Pads and stuff like that i have a like lot of the, that. The, the yeah the, the fluffy tunnels yeah i have a lot of that and then you yeah. know you get that kind of thing and i end up with bumps and all that kind of stuff so while we've had a lot of rain recently it's basically a lawn roller or something you you can either get small ones that you push or you get ones you pull behind a lawnmower and it's basically a giant Cylindrical, pin. cylindrical tank yeah it's like a giant rolling pin and you like fill it with water and you just drive it across your yard and it's like smooths out some of the rough stuff so i got one of those and we'll see if that helps i've done it once and it seems to help so far so we got we're getting rain for the next couple days here so maybe i'll try it again anyway so i'm doing that um and then also i helped my neighbor chip up a bunch of stuff they had some trees that fell and they've had brush sitting in their yard for like two months so i just offered to help them out um so they're, you know, more advanced in their years and I'm a little more spry. So I just did the neighborly thing and was asking to help them out. And they were really appreciative of that. So that felt is this pretty the good. Old, is this the old man that likes basketball? Uh, no. no. Okay. Dif different, different elderly neighbor. Oh, the one who asked me to like weld his basketball hoop. On yeah. Or whatever. No, different neighbor, different neighbor. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, look at you. Just... He hasn't called me yet. He hasn't called me yet. I'm like, where are you, dude? Well, that thing. Well, he's quick. missing his basketball. Is what he's doing. He's, I was telling you, like I said, he, I'd help him out. He, he doesn't have his basketball Jones anymore. I guess not. Um, oh man! But I've been, you know, doing some little welding projects here and there, welding some rings onto my trailer to make for more attachments and stuff. So that's been kind of fun. Um, and then my big project recently was I have a because we've had a lot of rain. I have this gutter like downspout that is just like dumping water in a place where it's not draining really well. So I needed to mm. like dig that up and extend the pipe underground like out like 40 feet so i could get it to drain properly down the hill so i was doing all of that and i had like i had done uh, a little um what's it called a little sidewalk to my sheds from the driveway and i needed to go under that so i had to like pull that up go under you know and do that whole thing so it was kind of a project but i got it all done and so i'm excited actually now that it's raining to go out there and see my new little pop-up like downspout thing underneath to see how it's all uh working there so hopefully is I'll that what a... you're doing immediately after this probably yes because it's like active, how's the how's, how's, how's the right now how's the mud bridge the mud bridge oh well it, it was rather eventful because it got clogged and the whole thing backed up wait um, hold on, hold on. How, no, no the the this this the sticks the bridge yeah, that you made yeah. to drive well with. so i have I have a creek. How can the bridge get clogged? Well, the bridge... Okay, so that bridge didn't technically... I mean, that one's been holding up. That one's oh, okay. been holding up. Excellent. But, but right before that one is the bridge, the land bridge that I built that crosses the creek that had a culvert pipe in it. Well, that, cul oh. that culvert pipe got clogged. And With like, like just brush and stuff? It was there was like a a, a log like you know how oh. I lined I lined the tr my trails with those those logs yeah well I had like dropped one and it kind of rolled into the creek like way further up and I was like ah whatever uh -oh. and I didn't want to go down and get it well it got carried all the way down <laughs> and then it clogged up that pipe oh and it no backed up it literally like dammed up the whole thing almost started oh. overflowing that land bridge and I was like oh gosh. So I pulled that thing out and then it just like was dumping water out. So I was like, okay. And you came out there, you saw that, that log and you said, you. Yeah. And I saw it looked up at you like, I'm back, Brian. Well, I didn't judge the log. I, I told you I'd be back. I, I knew when I dropped that log in there, I was like, it's probably going to, it's probably going to get moved at some point, but <laughs> I didn't think it would be like the next time it rained, but. You didn't whatever. know it would come back for a vengeance. Yeah. It was kind of surprising, but it was also kind of cool. It was like, wow, this thing really dams up quickly if it gets clogged oh well that's funny so yeah as long as i don't go dropping like 12 inch diameter logs in my creek then i'll be fine but All anyway right. so it's been fun i've just been uh, the weather's been more temperate the bugs aren't too bad yet the pollen is there but it's not terrible yet because we've been getting decent rain but it's coming you know it's coming that pollen is gonna yeah be i mean my, my, my car was pretty yellow this morning before the rain yeah but yeah that's what i've got going on all right all right now I'll couple of quick company updates as we wrap things up here. So, uh, yeah, just uh, things have been pretty smooth at work. You know, we've been continuing to kind of flex in some, like, team events and some meals and some more in-person stuff. You know, we're, like, knocking on wood and knocking on everything to make sure that no other variants and stuff are coming up. We're, like, tiptoeing our way back to normalcy, um, you know, to kind of... Uh, 
go with what uh, Fauci's talking about, but uh, you know, that's been, it's been good. It's felt, felt, it's felt better. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. We got a lot of new product launches and stuff that we're preparing for and doing. So that's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, we're going to be, we're looking towards, I'm not going to reveal anything, but we're looking towards doing pencasts in person again. We really could, we could be doing it right now, but we wanted to actually like prepare a space to be able to do that a little more of like a set. So we are working on that and we have some things that are going to be in that. So, uh, yeah, give it a couple, give us a couple of weeks and, uh, I think we'll be in good shape there. It'll be fun. Uh, but yeah, that's all I got around that. You got anything else, Drew? Or does that pretty much cover it? No, no. Um, we got to have a Chipotle lunch. That was fun. Yeah, that was you fun. You and Rachel came in. Usually uh, yeah. Rachel will come in and Brian will watch the kids or Brian will come in and Rachel will watch the kids. It's very rare I get to see Brian and Rachel both together. Uh, so that was that was pretty yeah. awesome. Getting, we're getting trying to, to do that. With we're you. trying to do that more. Yeah, we're going to try yeah, to like, so come in the, more regularly. That was pretty nice. Yeah, it was nice. It's good to, good to be back more. we got a good team. I'm very, very grateful. Um, yeah, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up for this week. Just want to thank everybody for watching. Please leave us some feedback in the comments. We'd love for you to ask us any questions. If you got recommendations for pens we should cover uh, or you know tips of the week that you'd like us to know, even if it's not a you have a tip, but you just have a problem and you want to know how to solve it, we can uh, maybe come up with a tip. Uh, so definitely check out goodlaypens.com for all your fountain pen, ink, and paper needs because that is what we do. Uh, you can email us at pencast at goulaypens.com. And I have a random fun fact for you to finish out since when this is publishing today will be April Fool's Day, April 1st. And while the origin of April Fool's Day is somewhat uncertain, uh, it's been said, or some people believe, that uh, maybe it started in 16th century France when the observation of New Year's changed from April 1st to January 1st. And those that continued to celebrate on April 1st were called April Fools. So not validated in any way, but perhaps some insight. Because I'll be honest with you, I'm like, who came up with this day? Like, what a what a ridiculous day to just like dream up out of nothing. So it has to have some kind of origin. Yeah. But like, let's just make a day that frustrates people and like makes bullying okay like where did this day come from i'm not a big fan of april fool's day in general personally i can tell but, yeah i don't know it's weird but some people like it i'm 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 it doesn't bother me when someone makes fun of me or plays a joke on me and i'm aware of it like mm. i can i can i can take jokes when i'm aware but when i'm not aware of them that that i have a tough to, i have a tougher time with that yeah, and that seems like that's a lot of the spirit of the day is to like yeah. intentionally try to catch you off guard and make you feel dumb, basically. Yeah, that, that, like, that is that is not a cozy feeling. Not super into that. So I don't know, whatever. Hope you all have had a good day. We didn't want to do anything <laughs> very April Fool'sy, so we just kept it pretty straight and narrow today. But we're just, I mean, we're fools every day. So there you go. We're April and every other month's, every other day's <laughs> fool, whatever. All right, I think we're done. Thanks, everybody. All right. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Right on. <laughs>